Um, welcome to the 141st Sustainability Salon, the first of a two or more part series um, uh, about creating and executing uh, sustained effective campaigns and building a movement and building different movements, uh, climate movement, human rights, civil rights movement, all kinds of movements, um, which are all connected, uh, as, as most of us know, since civil rights, before the civil rights movement, there was even more institutional differences set up between people by governments and like redlining and that kind of thing and differential uh, access to resources. And of course, the climate crisis is affecting and will continue to affect uh, disadvantaged people the world over more than the people who are actually perpetrating it more. So uh, we have with us today, uh, one, uh, we have going to have a couple of skilled trainers in movement building. Um, one will be joining us a little bit later, Kades Gebre, but uh, Penn Garvin is here and Penn got her start in activism back in the 60s with the original Poor People's Campaign. And uh, after the assassination of Martin Luther King and has worked on all kinds of human rights and peace and environmental issues, uh, nuclear power and nuclear weapons, nuclear kind of crosses to peace activism and environmental activism. Um, and uh, I met Penn uh, earlier this year at um, a gathering where we were trying to figure out how to go about building building up the uh, climate movement in Pennsylvania. Uh, and that has led to uh, the Pennsylvania Action on Climate. And Jim Highland, who was here with us, uh, was the one who brought Penn into this circle, I think. Or Michael Bagdas Canning, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, was very instrumental in all that. And so... Um, Penn has a, a very interactive style. So uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. I'm going to reiterate, um, keep yourself muted unless you're talking to the group to avoid annoying background noises. And uh, look after yourself. This workshop will be fairly long. We're Instead of different speakers, we're going to be all participating and with two main presenters today. Uh, but if you need to take a break, take a break. If uh, Be sure to hydrate yourself. Um, it is great if you can keep your uh, camera on, um, if you're comfortable doing that, uh, because the face is a window uh, for communication. Um, I have, because here in Pittsburgh, it is just uh, tonight is the first um, frost warning, freeze warning. So I may be listening in. That's why you see two of me here. I may be listening in on the phone as I dash about with plants and things. Um, but I'm very much here. And uh, uh, did I forget anything? I can't think of anything. Um, that is, uh, I will turn it over to Penn and I will pin Penn. No, I will spotlight Penn. Hello, Penn. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Marin. And I really want to thank Marin for inviting me. I did not know about these salons. I've not taken part in them before, but I think it's a great idea. And I was really pleased when we worked out for me to come and be able to talk with you all. This is, as she said, very interactive. So if you can leave, I know a lot of people are doing other things or they don't, or they feel their hair doesn't look good or whatever it is, 
But if there's any way that you can be on in terms of picture, that would be helpful um, because it does, I can get some ideas of what, what you're thinking just from looking at your faces. Um, I will be calling on you sometimes to just read something from the screen. I am gonna be showing something on a screen. I will say this, I am a long-term activist. I, am, I, I have a lot of knowledge and I'm very comfortable with my material. I am not good at technology. So there may be times <laughs> that I kind of look like I don't know what I'm doing and you know what, I probably won't. And somebody will call from you. One of you will say, well, did you forget to do this or do that? So just hang in there with me in terms of the technology. Okay. But, and um, actually that reminds me of two, or that gives me a segue to mention two other things. Good. Um, they have pointed out that some folks, because of their, what the internet, wherever they are, uh, since video uses much more bandwidth than audio, sometimes it's um, not practical to have the video on. Yes. Uh, but and then also, and she pointed that out in the chat, and that reminded me that the thing that I was trying to remember to say was, um, uh, by all means, put comments, questions in the chat, and uh, I and perhaps. Um, Mark Dixon, who is here with us. Thank you, Mark, for always being so helpful. Um, <laughs> I should have checked with you before. Um, uh, is a skilled uh, chat moderator. And so we will try to break in when there's a question, um, relevant question that needs addressing then, or we can as you pause, we can look back and see what points of discussion people might have. So, all right, take it away again. Thank you, Marin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I will try to be watching the, um, not only faces, but also the um, chat. And yet you're right. I understand there are times that I have to turn things off, uh, not today, yeah. but there have been times that I have to, um, just so that I can be able to stay on. So I totally understand that. So I'm going to start with, not, I'm not interested that much, I am interested, but I'm not going to ask you what organizations you work with, but I really want to start with the work that you are doing with an organization, if you are with an organization or a group, what exactly, and I'm going to, um, Maren, would you, could you put us on so we're all looking and I'm not yeah, sure. highlighted yet, yeah, so we can all, I'm interested in finding out from people what is it of the work, the political work that you do that you really are passionate about or really enjoy? Um, it, as, as I said, I'm not, you, you can mention what group you work with, but I'm really interested more in what it is that you are doing in your work that really draws you. And um, I'm not, we're not gonna take a long time. You don't have to do a whole history of how you got involved, but just, what draws you? For instance, I will say, I love teaching. I have loved teaching since I was a little girl and made my sister sit for hours while I taught. I've just found the context and the content that I can be using that for the political work that I am doing. So that's something that I love is teaching. Um, so that, that's one of the things. It may be something else. The other thing is you may say, I'm doing a lot of political work, but I'm not that drawn to what I'm doing, that's a valid thing to say when share with, with us. Or you might say, I'm not involved with political work now and I don't know what I would do, whatever it is, but we're just gonna go around and, and meet each other in that context of what is it of the political work that you're doing that you really enjoy. We're gonna kind of do a popcorn. So remember to unmute yourself and remember to call on somebody afterwards after you speak, but I'm going to start, Doug, I know you, I'm going to start with you, Doug. What draw, what is of, of the work that you do? What do you enjoy doing? I'm passionate about nature. So I love working with the environment because it gets me out and I get to enjoy nature. And, you know, I'm, I'm also doing it because I love my, my children and my grandchildren and my great granddaughter. So I'm really working for posterity and for all the voices that can't speak for themselves in nature that's great wonderful call on somebody um 
let's see. <laughs> How about pen, the other pen? I, um, I don't do much um, organized. I, I attend these kinds of things, as many of them. I do lots and lots of reading, and I post a lot on Facebook, both political and literary. Uh, and and people are are interested in that, like it. People who aren't interested don't like it. <laughs> they don't, I, I'm not attracting much uh, negativity, so I suspect I'm preaching to the choir. Um, I don't know what else to do, really. So I'm just trying to pay attention and, and speak to people when I can. Thanks, Penn. Call on somebody. I see my friend Bill Vanderveer. Hi, I um, am not a member of, uh, an active member of organizations other than uh, the Waverly Presbyterian Church Mission Committee and um, the, um, what's the other committee uh, that I'm on? Uh, property, that doesn't mean much here, but the mission committee does. We, we do some outreach work in the neighborhoods here, uh, helping people fix up their homes and um, I have done a fair amount of that in my career also. I'm now retired. Um, my concern, my, uh, if I have a passion uh, with regard to social justice, it's it's in the area of war and peace. And um, that's what my uh, major activity over my lifetime has been, starting in um, about 1970 when I lost my student deferment and had mm. to... Uh, avoid the the draft at that time by becoming a uh, conscientious objector mm -hmm. and so um that's been i guess my throughout the throughout the years and the many wars that this country has been involved in that's that's been my most um consistent concern and uh what i've i'm not nearly as well read as pen um hackney is by any means i know how well read you are pen <laughs> but I have done some reading on um, nonviolence and um, uh, the nonviolence and, and forgiveness in the political uh, international realm. Thanks, Bill. Will you call on somebody? Um, Dawn. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dawn Lehman, and yeah a challenging question in some ways. I, I would say, I mean, I have a background in conflict transformation and mediation, facilitation, restorative justice. And so facilitation is very dear to my heart and just being in dialogue spaces where people can go a little bit deeper in their own reflection and increasing understanding between one another. Um, I also work currently in the, the field of mindfulness. So just all of that, getting out of our heads, coming into our full experience as we think about these things. Um, and I would say as far as like in recent years, social justice work, I'm just sort of dabbling here and there, trying to keep um, connected with different groups, sort of looking for my place. <laughs> So housing is an important issue to me and, and really trying to um, understand where I can tap in with environmental issues. So I'm happy to be here to learn. Thanks, um, Dawn. Yeah, and maybe I'll pass it over to uh, Frank. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, Frank Kirkwood. Um, I do uh, most of my work with March on Harrisburg. And we are a pro-democracy, anti-corruption group. And uh, I enjoy the people and I enjoy the uh, political strategizing. And uh, we are, um, you know, working to uh, basically to fix the machinery of government so that it's possible for it to work for all of us and address the problems like uh, global warming, environmental problems, healthcare problems, the whole thing, uh, uh, you know, our look, our our take on it is that uh, if the machinery of government isn't working correctly, uh, we're going to have a hard time using the machinery of government to solve a lot of these problems. So 
That's what I do. So thank you, Frank. Remember, we, what I'm really interested in hearing from, and this has all been really good, is what draws you? What what of the work that you're doing? What is you? What are you passionate about? What do you really enjoy doing? You may do a lot that you don't, but what do you really enjoy doing? Frank, call on somebody, please. Uh, okay. Uh, how about Marin? Well, um, I am. Uh... Uh, I enjoy uh, enabling someone to understand what they might not have understood before. One of my things is because I have a science background, I I can knit the lay person and the science information together. Um, and I really enjoy it when I do that well. Um, I enjoy creating things and uh, that runs from protest signage and banners uh, to three-dimensional objects that make a point. Um, and uh, so I'm sort of become Pittsburgh's go-to uh, person for a lot of that. Um, and I enjoy bringing people together, which is, uh, and connecting, making connections that need to be made. Uh, and part of that I do, I mean, people connect with me, contact me to connect with someone who might do X, Y, or Z. And I can usually find that person for that information to connect them with. And then of course the sustainability salons, which I've been doing for almost 12 years are very much about connecting people and building community. And I don't know if you can hear my noisy dog in the background, but I sure can. Uh, Marin, call on somebody. And I was, yeah, I just had to try to sick my kid on the dog. <laughs> who probably sees her friend the woodchuck in the backyard um how about susan um and apparently someone has come to the salon oops <laughs> <laughs> um i'm i'm actually similar to Marin. i've got an engineering and science background and um in environmental engineering and science, but I am now a storyteller. And one of the, I've also run for public office and served in public office. I've, you know, done a lot of different things along the way, but right now, and I guess the through line is that I, I'm a problem solver. I like to look at complex systems and understand them and boil them down to a way that I can explain them to people, make them understandable, actionable, um, constructive, inspiring, and I'm really passionate right now at this exact moment about changing the narrative about climate. Hello. We, like, you are not the woodchuck. <laughs> Mary, are you okay there, Judy? Mute yourself, Marin. <laughs> are you okay? Okay, I couldn't hear you. Baron, can you mute yourself? Yeah, sure. I think oh, she's... that's okay. Marin, I hope you can join in. Can you mute? Are you yourself? able to join in on Zoom? Do I have your email? Yeah. I can't mute her, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll try to send you that pre-event email that has it directly, or more directly. Marin. Marin, can you mute Marin. yourself? Oh man, yes. I was muted. How did I get unmuted? Got unmuted somehow. Thank you. Okay, Susan, sorry. It's okay. I was almost done anyway. Just saying my current <gasps> passion is to um, try to change the narrative about how we talk about climate, how we talk about climate solutions, how we talk about people. Um, are we all relentlessly terrible and everything is doomed? No. <laughs> Spoiler alert, no. Um, radical compassion, cooperative you know, the summer of strikes, the idea of this 
sort of nascent uh, swinging back of the pendulum from rugged individualism to cooperation, cooperation and, and coming together as a way to counter the powers that be that are, you know, burning up the planet. So crafting that narrative and putting it in an accessible way that people can, you know, see themselves in and just and understand. And so I do that, like talking on Facebook, but I also do it in my stories, but I also do it when I get come here to places like this. Um, that narrative is to me part of the solution and I'm all about solutions. So, and I guess I will pick Mark and hand it off to Hi there, everybody. I'm Mark Dixon. Um, kind of helped to spark the idea for the salon with Marin, but she's been the primary, the primary vessel for it all these years. Um, I, I'm motivated as a filmmaker, environmental filmmaker, environmental activist, photographer. I have been motivated for quite some time um, by the notion of intergenerational justice. That I feel that the degradation of the of the living conditions of all people going forward, possibly in perpetuity, at least in terms of a meaningful um, context for human beings, um, is is um, catastrophically unfair and um, immoral. And and I feel that it's my duty, living in the circumstances that I am, with the resources that I have, to work doggedly to throw my weight on the pile of those trying to turn to turn you know turn the turn the trajectory away from that what sometimes feels like inevitable outcome so that's I, I do not have grandchildren i do not have children partly because of climate change my wife and i you know had some limited options but one of the decision points was to not have children because um the planet has so many people already living and and that we didn't want to contribute an extra person. Um, I, we allow for everybody making their own decisions about that, but um, we're not motivated by our own direct descendants necessarily, but by the sort of overarching moral compulsion um, spearheaded by a sense of intergenerational justice. Um, and um, I love the work. I, I don't know that I could do any other work and left my career in tech to do this work and try to meld how I make a living with my moral obligations to the world, I feel. Um, I also try to regard my life as not being entirely my own because I'm sitting on the shoulders of so many countless people who came before and 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 so I'm trying to act as a an agent of continuity instead of just mark the guy. So um, that's how I feel about it. That's what's motivating to me. And um, it's really nice to hear what motivates everybody else too, because it takes everybody. So thanks. Um, I will point to um, Kate Bissell. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kate Fissell. I do work with, um, I volunteer for a couple of groups, but I can't say I truly um, passionately enjoy the work I do for them. It doesn't intersect with my interests too much. Um, really, the motivation is, good God, I've got to do something. And so I do enjoy feeling that I've contributed in some way. Uh, to the extent I've been able to get involved in environmental justice work, I can say I truly enjoy when I've been able in some small way to make what I consider a meaningful connection to somebody who's not in my socioeconomic, racial, et cetera, background. Um, but that is hard and opportunities are scarce. So I will call on uh, Simone. Thanks, um, can you hear me okay? I don't have my headphones in. Um, I'm Simone, um, she or they, and I uh, am really passionate um, about all the intersecting justice issues, but um, primarily being a water protector um, and changing the social paradigm of how we understand um, 
our world and the the way we coexist. Um, so kind of like Marin said, I really love just um, um, having conversations that help us learn new things. And I like learning new things, which is why I'm happy to be here. Um, I'll pass it to uh, Tommaso. I don't know if you've gone. Hi, yeah, sorry, I had to feed my cat. Are we doing introductions? We're, we're, what we're doing is we're asking everybody to talk. What is your passion? What 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 do you do in your political work and what brought you there for, and what's your passion for? Okay, got gotcha. you. Um, well, my personal passion is seeing communities grow, fostering connections. I love engaging people, especially young people my own age. Um, with the political process, I see a lot of apathy and disdain for it currently, and I don't believe it has to be that way. So I really love changing those kind of paradigms and the way uh, people choose to engage with the political process, as well as uh, to some extent knowing that um, it's not a, you know, the, the current future is not a, a fixed thing. You know, I, I can have an impact in my own way, but it's choosing those battles and understanding more about how the system works and who works within it to try to affect change, you know, in the small way that I can. Thanks, Tommaso. Can you call on somebody? Sure. Um, um, what about Meredith? Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I won't try to butcher your last name. Meredith J. I'll take that. <laughs> um, I would say, well, my, my work has been in leadership, leadership development, facilitation, um, and so I'm really interested in and in how just I guess how that kind of intersects with a lot of this work. Um, I'm also a certified coach. And so there's a big movement around climate change coaching and just kind of helping people deal with just the <laughs> the grief and, and the mourning and the, you know, an action that can come from thinking about the climate and issues. And so I'm, I would say I'm really passionate and interested in exploring that and really figuring out how to help people overcome that. Um, and as a, as a parent of two young kids who struggled with the question of whether or not to have kids because, the, because of the climate, um, I'm also really interested in helping um, parents and especially parents like myself who just feel so busy and overwhelmed. I mean, I, I think like the last couple of years, I've been so overwhelmed and, and stressed with just young motherhood um, that it's, you know, but, but also paying attention to what's happening in the world and feeling really stuck and not knowing what to do. So um, I'd like to help women like myself, parents like myself, figure out how to really distill what's happening, get over the grief of, of what this means for us, what this means for our kids and other generations and 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 really move past that ultimately or harness it really to to create action and movement so um let's see um has doogie verns gone nope all right doogie verns <laughs> doogie are you there can you unmute yourself? Uh, maybe not. Maybe he's not available. So let's go to Laura Campbell. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Laura. And I am newly retired. I worked in healthcare management. Um, I love one volunteer activity or group of activities I do at Phipps. And I have seen um, Phipps, I think, uh, very successfully do a lot of community outreach and education. And I help with some of the educational programs. So I am passionate about um, climate um, issues. And I'm at kind of a crossroads of my life where I'm looking for ways to be 
be more of an activist. Um, a, a useful area where I can contribute. Um, and that's about it. Thanks, Laura. Can you call on somebody? Uh, have we called on Thea yet? Thea, can you, uh, yeah. Hello. Um, hello. 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 Um. Yes. Um. Well, I'm Pash. Um. I'm. I, I am and have been fairly active in social justice issues. Um, relating. Um, including relating to housing, the built environment, and the social environment, social capital. Um, um, what I'm passionate about is um, identifying solutions, particularly evidence-based solutions, and connecting people with with um, you know disparate people and groups um, um, with that information and also with each other and with other resources. Um, I um, I'm in Pittsburgh, um, and um, I will um, pass it to Bill. Hi, I'm Bill. I'm, I'm assuming I'm the Bill she passed it to. Uh, Take it away, Bill. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I'm th thinking of different volunteer activities I've done. Um, and the ones that are most drawing me are the ones that are not political, that no one can oppose it for any sane reason. Um, and I don't know, maybe I need a break. I've done some work with climate and that's what matters the most to me. But probably my favorite thing I was involved, this is why I live in Portland. We were going around and determining the species of every every tree that was on the street lining in their condition and whether there was overhead wires. And um, and it was creating like a real nice database for, this, for the city. So they knew, you know, hey, do we have a block? Um, solidly of this species that would be susceptible to disease. And, you know, what do we need more? What do we need for diversity? Um, where can we encourage future planning? And um, so, I don't know. I've also been involved with um, Citizens Climate Lobby. And the thing I like about them is they're, they're pursuing something that um, no one can reasonably argue with. I'm sure there are, there are people that argue with it, but, you know, it's all, it's all positive, let's do this, you know. Um, so I don't know, maybe I'm burnt out on the conflict bit, but I'm, I'm really drawn right now about things that you can do. Um, everyone can support, you know, planting trees. It's like, who can argue against planting trees? You know, so I've, I've gone out and done that. So anyway, um, have we called on Kate yet? Oh no, I think we did. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so how good? Sierra has not been called on. That's what I was about to do. Sierra, where three are. Hi there. Um, I am a new AmeriCorps member serving with Three Rivers Waterkeeper. Uh, I just had my first week, but we had our big fundraiser yesterday and an outreach program this morning. So I'm going to have my camera off for most of the day. I just have low energy, but I'm happy to be here. And my, my passions are also in connection. Um, I have a background in science and art. And I think a lot of our, um, our issues, our current issues stem from colonialism, which has severed so many connections, connections between people and communities and people and the land. So what I've been fo focusing on for the past couple years is really bringing people or just helping them grow their their attention bone. And I think like paying attention and fostering relationships with the natural world around them and having like growing relationships with place is really healing on a personal level and hopefully that has effects um, ripples out to a political level too um and i just want to say that my favorite tool 
of connection are pigments. And I have a couple with me so I can show you guys. Um, so these are made with ochres in the creek, um, goldenrod. I have some ash from a fire and one of these is an insect. And I just think that pigments have, have, have stories to tell and they're super engaging. Um, and so, the, so I make little paintings and try to engage people that way. Yeah. Um, okay, who can I call on? Let's see, there's Marcy has not been called on. Jim Highland has not been called on. Marcy? Hi. Um, so I like to encourage other people and I like to be encouraged myself. Um, so is that a passion? Eh, maybe. Um, uh, so um, I guess we encourage each other by taking roles and that's what I've done. I've taken on supporting roles. I'm not a leader. Um, but um, I like it when someone who's a leader can give me a role that I can fulfill. Like um, some of the things I've done are I've done some researching, I've done online researching, and I also have done scouting uh, in my car. And since I have a car, I'm, I, I do help by driving. And um, that's something I can do, but I do a lot of logistical things too. Um, I can track finances for people because it's important to keep track of those kinds of things. Um, and I guess maybe the most exciting thing that I've done recently, well, I can't say it's the most exciting because I've done so many exciting things in the name of activism this year. And one thing that I want to mention is that I do have a passion for animal rights and I was able to run logistics and help set up a workshop for our Green Party um, Animal Rights Committee at the uh, National An Annual Meeting. And um, I'll call on uh, Doug Mason. Have you spoken? Yes, he has. Okay, Julia? Hi. No, I haven't. Um, I am really excited to be here and hear everybody's passions. I want to say... I'm a socialist and I'm passionate about the end of capitalism, whether it's in my lifetime or another. And I think that something that we don't always have time for is the creative conversations where we imagine a world that is not driven by profit. And I love to have those and get to hear what everybody thinks we could do if we used our resources to better our world for each other. Thanks. Thanks, Julia. I think Jim, I'm gonna call on you, Jim. All righty. Uh, so uh, stuff that makes me feel passionate um, is uh, like, like some other people have said, bringing connections, but especially connections between uh, folks doing work in government reform, political reform, like fair districts and connecting them with the environmental movement because I think we, we, we help each other. So I get I get a real kick out of out of doing that, and then also out of just you know the getting to to, to meet people and talk to people, um, uh, either who are doing activism or are people who are just suffering from you know the environmental degradation that's that, that's going around, and and hearing their stories because that that gives me a whole lot of energy to to do more. Um, let's see, is there anyone? I Betsy has not been called on. Okay, it's how about Betsy? You? Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, I'm coming from Olympia in Washington State. Um, I think the thing that drives me is um, both learning and being able to share that with other people and seeing them empowered, um, particularly with regard to cutting through the corporate marketing bullshit and and the dominant social narrative sometimes about various things um, using data and empirical evidence. And I really like that. And I think, Beth, uh, thank you, Betsy. Matthew, you've not spoken. Yeah. 
Hi, thank you. Uh, sorry I joined a few minutes late. I've had a lot happening today, but um, really appreciate being able to be here. Um, so I, I take it that what folks are talking about is what they're passionate about. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have um, a lot of things, but um, if you get right down to it, what really gets me uh, interested is um, how, how, how people find meaning um, and understanding all sorts of ways that um, people achieve that and making sense out of complexity uh, to get to the heart of what gives people meaning. So that's really, the, you know, there's a lot to that. Sometimes that means looking at the history and context of why people interact the way they do. So getting deep down into that historical narrative to try to unwind some things. Sometimes that means studying how people interact with each other and with systems and technology to see how those pieces fit together. Um, sometimes that involves design thinking. So thinking about how new things can be built and what, what is new and creative, um, and, and how to go about doing that in a morally responsible way. Um, so that's, you know, defines a lot of the, the things that I've done over the past, oh, I wanna say 30, 30 years or so. Um, and there's just one other thing. Um, I'm really also am passionate about music. Um, that's a side that I don't rarely get to engage in, in all the work that I do, um, but, you know, privately, that's something that I enjoy very, very much. Um, all different genres of music. Um, and, you know, anytime we can bring any of that into the work that we're doing, um, I, I really enjoy that and celebrate that. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and I guess I guess I'm the last one. So um, I think Mar Margaret, did you speak? You have to unmute. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Hi. I'm Margaret. This has just been a thrill to listen to all of you, and it's odd to be last. Um, my passion is beauty and truth and justice. You know, it sounds philosophic, but I love philosophies. I, I love the language of learning, and and I love how we frame, you know, our time. I observe life. I'm a poet. I'm writing. Um, I'm very interested in journalism. I'm interested in how we talk about our lives, capturing our reality and portraying the truth of our experience. I have a art studio in a community center. I've been there for about 10 years now and it's evolving. Um, I, I've also been a nurse. So um, my first job was in cardiothoracic post-op and in that place I saw everybody's lungs being ripped out of their chest secondary to cancer. And you know, so then that started my research in into the environmental degradation and the impact on public health. And I still have a big passion for trying to solve that problem, how we're gonna move forward in a world that's more and more at, at, at risk, how little people seem to understand the relationship between viruses and poverty and stress and war and all the social impacts of of what we have really neglected the social neglect of a safe environment so that's that's the idea you know how do we frame it you know how do we create um a beautiful art piece that just hits to the core of people's understanding that's the meaning everyone's talking about how to frame it so the arts do that, music does that, of course, the logistics, the science, how we structure moving forward, you know, with every truth in our, our last little bones, you know, to kind of move our generation of thinkers and doers in the direction that really will provide a, a safer future. How we organize around, you know, emergency, how we organize people around trauma, how we provide support for everyone's mental health, <laughs> either through the arts or through our writing or through community building, obviously that's what we're doing. So I'm hoping the studio that I'm building has somehow a, you know, a relevance to education and bringing exactly what we're talking about into a forum, public forum, Hazelwood 
you know, is building, Hazelwood Green is big. How do we couple philosophy with robotics and biotechnology so we have a moral future? That's the conversation I'm interested in. Thank you, Thanks. Margaret. I think everybody here has spoken better. Maren, somebody came in person, so I want to see if that person would like to participate. I don't know how you're working that out in terms of the Zoom call, but. Did we hear from Bill Wexelman? Was a hit. It, oh, yes. Bill Wexelman. Good. But yeah, the, the, there's nobody there. So Bill, are, Maren, yeah, why don't I let Maren first and then Bill, if you're there, let's uh, give you a chance. So Maren, the person yeah, who's- the remaining person um, decided to head back home and join in from there. And she has not yet materialized. Okay. Um, I think there was another time that she- came and sat here but because I was okay. in the salon um my kid greeted her at first and so she when I was shouting again apologies for that I was calling to her to make sure that was what her preferred outcome was so uh I hope that she'll be able to join from home great thanks Marin and I think Bill are you there Bill Wexelman and Doogie also wasn't previously responding. Doogie, are you there now? I don't even see that person on. And oh, and Helen Gerhardt has joined us. Um, Helen, uh, I'm so glad that uh, you were able to come. Uh, uh, okay. There you I, are. Yes, I'll let hey, you introduce didn't yourself. To and be speaking about anything though, we're so talking I was about coming. yeah, we're talking about um, what we are passionate about. What what brings us joy to do in terms of potentially in activist work, but I will leave it back to Penn to further clarify. So go ahead, Helen. We're glad to have you with us. Sure. Wait, so are we all sharing or is it? Mm -hmm. We've all just shared. You're okay, the last great. person. So you won't, you unfortunately won't hear the others, but we shared, as Marin said, what is our passion? What is the work that you do that you're passionate about? I think um, trying to think about our communities as ecosystems, <laughs> uh, you know, trying the, the three main areas of organizing um, I've worked on over the past few, you know, I guess decade or so are the connections between housing justice, a public transit, um, food sovereignty, and then racial and migrant justice and um, truly inclusive public um, planning. So where communities that are most impacted by policies are helping to shape those policies, and especially, uh, you know, those communities that, that have experienced um, systemic um, discrimination over time. So um, in terms of race, in terms of um, ethnic origin or mig migrant status, um, in terms of um, differing abilities. Um, so I, I have been, it's been wonderful to work with uh, just so many great people in these different fields from the Pittsburgh Food Policy Council to Pittsburghers for Public Transit, um, to uh, Homes for All, the Penn Plaza Support and Action Coalition. So uh, I really love bringing together the world of organizing and um, policy making and community planning. Wonderful. Well, there is a wealth of information, experience and passions here among this group. And I, I often get the question and Maren said she did too of, well, what's the most effective thing? I don't know quite what to do. What should I be doing? And I think that's really the wrong way of looking at it. My suggestion is start with your passion whatever your passion is, if it's entering data in the computer, if that's your passion, great. If it is, somebody said music, that if that's your passion, great. Whatever it is and anything in between, because all of those things are needed. And the, the issue is not what is the most effective. If you're passionate, that's what's gonna make something effective. 
If you're not passionate and you're just doing what the organization says you should go knock on doors. I hate to knock on doors, but I'll go knock on doors because that's what I'm that, that's not going to work. So I, I, I really encourage all of us to share with each other in our organizations, take the time as we did here. It took you know 45 minutes, but it was a good thing to know what people's passion are. And it's a good thing to say that to yourself and to others and to be clear what that is and to clarify that. So I just wanted to really emphasize, start with your passion, not start with what's needed. Start with your passion. That's what's needed. And then you can figure out um, how to use that. For instance, I had a, somebody come to me and said, I love dance, but I don't know what to do with that. I said, oh my goodness, all of our boring demonstrations, we would love to have flash mobs or theater or something. It, just go with what your passion is and find people who are willing to incorporate that into the work and, and be pushy, be a little pushy. It may not be what they are originally think of. But that all of uh, of the the passion that is here, all of what you feel drawn to, that's what we should be doing and using. So wanted to start off with that. I'm going to I I, I we've been sitting here for a little bit. I'm going to have um I'm going to do one thing and then we're going to stand up and just move. I'm not giving a whole big break, but just move. As Marin said, take care of yourself. If you need to step away and get food, you want to. Eat on the, I think we all have seen people eat, just eat if you need to, whatever it is you need to do. So um, thank you, Maren. Maren just popped something in your mouth, just as I said that. So please just take care of yourself. This is a, a, a place, to, it's a safe place um, that we can do what all, all of us need to do to be able to stay together and really think about some of these things. What we're going to do now is I, I'm, I'm going to show uh, two two documents that I'm then going to send to Marin and Marin can send out to all of you um, after this. So don't feel like you have to take notes. All the stuff we're going to be, most of the stuff we're going to be doing today and, and probably all of it that we're going to get to given the time today. I have a lot that we could do, but I think given the time today, you're going to have a send out to you. So don't, don't be taking notes, really focus more on what's being talked about and what that brings up for you and your own thinking and your own experiences and share that. So just wanna put that out for those of you who are note takers. Um, I'm gonna share my screen right now and um, I'm going to um, talk about a document here. We've been talking about the different kinds of work that people do, um, the different kinds of passions that people have. Um, and so what I wanted to do is share something from um, a book by Bill Moyer, not the Bill Moyers, but Bill Moyer, who was very active in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, he is no longer alive. He was a good friend of mine, and I was involved a lot with this work that he was doing in workshops. And so I use this. This is one framework of how to look at the kind of work that we need, and also the kind of steps, the kind of process that this goes through in terms of do in terms of doing um, social movement. This is the second page where I'm, we're going to be doing a lot of this today. So I'm just putting this up to show you. This is what you will get. This is the the steps that social movements go through. And I'm gonna say I've been involved with social movements since the 60s, everything from um, animal rights to obviously um, things about the environment and women's issues. I have never seen a movement that did not follow these steps. So you can see here, I'm gonna sort of point out normal times up in the far left and the top left goes from normal times to prove the failure of official institutions to ripening conditions. And you can see with ripening conditions, there are protests that go to the power holders. All of this we're gonna go into in the next couple of hours. So I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of a roadmap of where we're going. Then the takeoff, you know, the trigger event, and then a perception of failure and the majority public opinion. Once again, you can see here, 
This is where protests happen to the power holders. From there down to success, and once again, it doesn't mean we aren't pressuring the power holders and continuing the struggle. So we're gonna be talking about these different movements and what's and part of them. We're gonna be talking about characteristics of movement process. We're gonna be talking about the power holders. All of this is what we're gonna be covering um, today. But I'm gonna go um, back to um, just, I'd like for us to just stand up for a minute and just, you know, shake, move for a minute and then sit down. If you got to run and get something, do that, but just stand up. And sitting too long is not a good thing for anybody. So just stand up and move around, whatever you want to do. Turn your camera off if you want and you need to, but just move around for a little bit and then we'll sit back down. And I am going to start showing something okay so i am going to show the page um this was this work was actually put into a um a youtube which i will uh, that 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 link to this youtube is going to be sent to you um so i'm going to now start showing um can you all see that Somebody unmute and say yes, if you can. Yes. Yes, oh. it's right there. Okay, good. good. Good, this is, that's the part that I'm not so clear on uh, being, uh, making sure that I, I do well, but the four roles of activists. So Bill Moyer did a lot, he was a engineer and uh, a sociologist, and he did a lot of, some of you have talked about this, he was very interested in what went into the kinds of activities that people did in social movements. And he was involved with a lot of them, the civil rights movement, um, the, uh, the women's movement, um, the anti-nuclear movement, et cetera, et cetera. He was involved with a lot of movements and studied them also. So he found that there are four roles of activists um, and, they, they've been called different names, but we're gonna call, I'm gonna use the names that, that he's used here. And I, I'm gonna just have you start to look at those, these roles of activists, because one of the things that is important to know is that where do you fit in? And you may fit in more than one. So the citizen, and I've heard a number of people talk about, they liked figuring out the trees in their town, et cetera. Some things are, are good for citizens to do. Work in community centers, work with um, food distribution. A lot of things, it's just one of those kinds of being part of your community, being a good citizen. Now you see to the right of that is the reformer. The reformer is the type of person who's going out and looking at how to change laws. And we're gonna go into more detail about this, but how to work with the power establishment and how to get laws changed, how to uh, lobby, et cetera. Change agent underneath that is a person who is working with bringing networking, bringing people together. And the rebel on the left and bottom part is the person people who get out on the street. Um, as we go through this, I want you to, and we're gonna be looking at what each of the basic characteristics of each one, I want you to be thinking about yourself and see where you fall, fall here. And you may fall in all of them or two or three of them, just sort of see where, where you fall on, on, on this. The other piece is I want you to see if there's any of them that you kind of go, oh, really? I wouldn't want to do that. Sort of see where your negative feelings are too. You may find some of them you feel sort of negative about. Um, that's an important piece to understand. Looking at this, I'm going to show you here. You see on the left, it says forward facing. And then it says the others, reformer and change agent backstage. Forward facing means that these are the people we see more often, the ones who are in the soup kitchens, the ones who are out there handing out things when people need them, when there's a disaster, et cetera. 
the rebel out on the street, we, Black Lives Matter summer, a couple of summers ago, we uh, out on the street uh, protesting. Those are the people we see more. Um, they're forward facing. They're, they're, that's the term that was used. Reformer and change agent are more behind the scenes. The people who do the lobbying, et cetera, and the change agent who pulls people together, pulls groups together, but may not be as visible. So that's, I just want you to be kind of aware of, and as we move forward here, I want you to be thinking about where you are in this. Okay, so with the citizen, now I'm gonna start calling on some of you and I have your names here. So I'll just call on you kind of randomly because I want you to read some of this so that we can all be on the same page with it. So if I call on you, just un unmute yourself and read the part that I've asked you to read. So up here, the under citizen, right above citizen, it has three dots there. And Bill, I'm gonna call on you to read those three dots, not the in, ineffective, but the one that's right above citizen. Okay, these are challenging to read, but um, small. Promotes positive, widely held values, e.g. democracy, freedom, justice, nonviolence. Grounded in center of society and protects against charges of extremism. Okay, thank you, Bill. Is it hard to read? Was that hard? Is it hard to see them? They're a little small for me, but okay. I should be wearing glasses. It just depends on your screen size. You can always, if your screen is large enough, you can see it quite easily. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, good. So, okay. So the citizen or the helper, sometimes they're called. Who has, who, who here has taken part in something that's like soup kitchens or working with the homeless or doing something that's considered, it's not considered um, you know, you're helping people, but it's not considered too radical and off the chart. Somebody who, unmute yourself if you have and talk a little bit about what drew you to that. Bill, you want to do that? You raised your hand. Yeah, sure. As a career, I worked with uh, uh, low-income homeowners to help make repairs that they could not otherwise afford. So I had a lot of contact uh, with uh, people in all different levels of need um, from very desperate to, you know, just a, a, mod a modest little change that they couldn't afford. But um, um, I was, uh, you know, experienced in the different qualities of, of poverty or the different degrees of poverty, I guess, in, in that in that way. Is that sort of what you're after? It's exactly right. That's exactly right. And the um, mutual aid societies grew up or groups that grew up during the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. And the more marginalized a community is, black communities and poor communities, et cetera, the more marginalized your community is, um, the more often you will see more of these kind of helping people to survive every day. So it's not only, for, I'm not even gonna to have to go into why it's a good thing to do that, but it also is important that we are not known as just progressives or political people or not known as just being against something. You know, we're against what the government policies are on this, or we're against this or that, but also what we are for. This is a very important part. So if that is something that you're drawn to, and once again, I'm gonna ask you, Write down, say, yes, I've done this and this and this. Be thinking about what you've done or what you are drawn to in terms of this. Many of you spoke to this because of time. I'm not going to go into re re calling on everybody, but just write down if that is something you're drawn to. It's a very important part of the work that we are doing. Um, so I'm going to ask um, then, okay, Thea, yes, you had a question, Thea. Oh, no, sorry. I um, misunderstood. I thought you were asking people to say what their experiences were as a citizen. Yeah, if if if, I, if we were in person, I would get us in small groups and have people share, but I'm not going to because it, it, that's hard to do, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. 
So I'm going to move over here to um, the reformer. Okay. Um, let me let me move this along a little bit here. Um, so here we've done the citizen, and we've seen what, and we will talk a little bit. I'm gonna I am gonna stop it here. We're gonna talk a little bit about the ineffective part of each of these has an ineffective part. So I'm going to ask Margaret, will you unmute yourself and read the ineffective part of the citizen? Ineffective citizen um, does not realize the power holders and institutions serve elite interests. Super patriot, blind obedience to power holders and country. So this is how, this is a negative way that people can go. If you if you are somebody who does not understand how about power holders and who they serve, then your citizen involvement, in, involvement can be not helpful to the movement. And certainly if you have blind obedience, you're not being helpful. So these are, each of these has a positive and, a, and an ineffective part. Um, so any thoughts on this? We're gonna move on to the reformer, but I wanna just sort of open it up to any thoughts that somebody might have on this. Just- uh, Voting voting is crucial for citizens and encouraging people to vote, pers persuading them, begging them to vote. The more people that vote, the better results will be. I'm convinced of that. Good, thank you, Penn, yes. Yes, and and working with with you know for with, with the electoral process is very much a good citizen, and very and crucial. Each one of these is crucial to, as part of making change, social change. Each each one of these. The issue is some people are drawn to one and are better at one more more of one than the other. That's the important thing is to figure out where your strengths are. But each one of these, it's not, there's no one better than the other or not as good or not important. So, yeah. Um, okay, now we're going to do the reformer. I'm going to ask, um, let's see, uh, Matthew, will you unmute yourself and read the one right above the reformer, which is the, the, the basic good parts of a reformer? Thanks. Yeah. Reformer uses official channels to make change, uses variety of means, lobbying, legal action, elections, monitors success to assure enforcement, expand success and guard against backlash. OK, so these are the people that many of them worked with Biden's administration to come up with the, I, the Inflation Reduction Act and you know so forth and so on. Many people do a lot of lobbying. Um, the Unitarian Universalist Church does a lot of lobbying. These are people who are trained or train get training in how to do lobbying, how to run, how to help with elections, are really part of that. So somebody who's done that, raise your hand and or just unmute yourself and, and speak. Somebody who's passionate about this kind of work and has been involved with it, please do that. Anybody here? Yeah, I've been working uh, with the campaign in Ohio for a referendum <laughs> on abortion rights that's happening this November. Um, but. I think I usually fall more in the rebel box. So joining this kind of uh, electoral system is interesting and, and different. So I'm glad to see this represented here. Yes, very good. Yeah, yeah. And the, the best is getting skills in each of these because at different stages in the um, social movements at different stages, one or the other is more important. So I like what you said, you know, I'm usually the rebel, but I really worked with, with this and I'm learning a lot. That's important. Years ago, I worked with a group um, and they were willing to get arrested, et cetera. And then we had to do lobbying and people said, I said, I couldn't get anybody to lobby. And I said, I don't get it. You'll get arrested, but you won't go and lobby. And somebody said to me, you taught us how to get arrested. You didn't teach us how to lobby. Oh, okay. <laughs> So it's really, you know, it's that that hammer and nail and hammer kind of thing. 
Get the skills you need so that when that comes up, you don't say, oh, I don't know how to do that. You go, yeah, I can help with that because that's what's needed now. So the more that you can get the skills needed, the better off you'll be. Um, Does working for something. a union work? Is that an official channel to make change? Being absolutely a union advocate and all of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And in union work, you do you you have to do a lot of these. OK, yes. it's not just yeah. one or the other. It's all four of these. Mm -hmm. but absolutely. And thank God unions are coming back again. And young people have a different attitude about unions and, than 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 used to be. So absolutely. Anybody else with a statement or question? I just I wanted to jump in and add how um, well I, I've got postcards right here that I'm filling out. <laughs> Um, and I do a lot of that citizen work out loud where people can see me. And I feel like I do a lot of educating people like, hey, here's a thing you can do. You can write postcards or you can call your representatives or sort of like teaching people how to be citizens. Yes, mm -hmm. that's I critical now. People are not really taught that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, writing letters to the editor, good citizen, you know? Yeah. So in terms of reformer, okay, so we know kind of the lobbying and getting legislation and you're starting to push on certain things, et cetera, but ineffective. And um, let's see, uh, Bill K, will you read about ineffective? Unmute yourself and read. Am I the Bill K you want? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, promotes minor reforms, co-optation, identifies more with official power holders than grassroots, limited hierarchy, limited by hierarchical patriarchal structure, and does not advocate paradigm shifts. Okay, so here is the ineffective thinking of very minor reforms instead of something which will do a paradigm shift. And anybody want to do a, a, a definition of paradigm shift? Just unmute yourself and do a definition of paradigm shift. If you have one way of looking at the world and how it works, um, and then something helps you shift to a, a different point of view on how the what the world is and how it works. Exactly. Exactly. So with with the kinds of reform you want to be looking at something that's makes it's a big lever it it's a paradigm shift in how our country our our society looks at something so that's really important to be aware of that if you are co-opted easily if you um say well you know I, I, I know we didn't quite get everything we wanted, but um, you know, I got the the commissioners to really like us. That's not necessarily what the work is about. You know, it's about focusing on changes that can happen through lobbying and legislation. Any thoughts on that? Any experience people had of negative things that have happened with reforms? Oh, I just can't help but um, remember all the pushback from the hierarchy of the medical community, you know, the, the corporate structure against, you know, the nurses. Right. You know, it and the patriarchy, I mean, it was an old capitalist structure that was imposed since the 60s. And whatever it was that we thought we were practicing in the sciences, I mean, we're still advocating for change. But there, it's constant co-optation. We get incremental changes. We're taught somehow, the nurses are taught, be satisfied with these incremental changes. But what we really need is a shift away from a corporate structure of healthcare. And convincing people are having the right language within the unions, it's just such a challenge to break through somehow. Yes. You know, the language using it, I don't know. Don't have an answer for that yet. No, I. I but you, you're, you speak to that exactly. Mm -hmm. Some of that is, and all of these, and you'll see this when we start talking about the different stages, we often think that we're always supposed to be pushing on our you know, elected officials, whether locally or nationally. No, no, 
a lot of the work that we need to be doing in social movements has to do with speaking a, a horizontally to other people. Somebody mentioned about talking with people who to get them interested in and even know about that. That's what our, a lot of our work is. So we, if we get too much into the power structure and so forth, then that'd be the only place. And we're not talking to people. We don't know what resonates with them and what doesn't. Mark. Yeah, I think uh, a, a common concern that I have encountered or in myself as I watched some of the dynamics happen with reformer types is that by the definition of the type, their ability to make change is dependent on their connectivity to the to the formal channels. And so they are very reluctant to make waves inside those formal channels that might jeopardize their connectivity or or ascent into them. And so I find that's a that's a really challenging and delicate balance to to navigate if you want to maintain connectivity to the other three types um, and and act in solidarity with them. I think people mm -hmm. often think that they're making the changes that they can when the other groups may regard the changes that they think they can make as being woefully inadequate and yeah. and just focused on increasing their personal resume. Absolutely. I'm going to tell a story and then I'm going to call on you, Penn. Um, I worked with the with a group called ACT UP, which was active in the 80s around the AIDS epidemic. And during that time, some of them started working with, um, it was actually Fauci, the same Fauci that we had, um, and others um, trying to get um, medicines to come out. And 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 trying to as fast as possible to get um, new meds to, to be be developed, and it was slow, and people were dying, and there was a lot of, but there was a lot of problems because sometimes they got to the people who were negotiating with the with with the uh, uh, government got too close with them, and they would say, well, just hold off a little bit, don't keep pushing, and. They finally were removed, actually. Those people who kept saying, don't, don't keep pushing. So that, that's exactly limited by, uh, limited by hierarchical and patriarchal structure. You know, people who don't see that they are the mouthpiece for the movement. They are not to shut the movement down because of what the hierarchy or the people in power say. So that was a really good point. Penn. Um, I want to just say a word for incremental change. Um, obviously, it's not all there is. We need to not be satisfied. You said satisfied with it. I agree we shouldn't be satisfied, but we need to, to not um, not be working against it either. Incremental change is important through legal action, legislation, administrative decisions, changing your neighbor's mind next door. Um, the, and the paradigm shift, folks, I think need to understand that there's a place for incremental change. Well, I, Penn, I like what you say because incremental change, if we don't have that, you're not gonna have any paradigm shift. People don't jump from A to Z. They have to go through steps. And so I like that. Very, very good. I'm gonna move on unless there's another thought here. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the citizen and the reformer, and now we're going to talk about the rebel. Okay, so the rebel is one of the ones that is visible, and um, I'm going to ask, um, let's see, uh, uh, whoever and I called on, Marcy, will you read um, the, what's under the rebel? Unmute yourself and read what's under the rebel. Give me a second to make this bigger again. Okay. Because that's going to take me a minute to do. Okay. Maybe I'll have you read the I'm ready. I'm ready. You ready? Good. Okay. That wasn't very long. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, protests say says not. Starting again. Protests says no to violation of positive values. Uses nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience, puts problems in public spotlight, 
strategic, exciting, courageous, risky. Thank you. Okay. So I want to say a couple of things here. A lot of what social movements are based on is to point out that our country says that it has a certain value. Let's say equality, that we're all equal. We all kind of think that we're sort of brought up thinking that was in our constitution and in our in a, it, the um, Declaration of Independence, this equality idea. But in fact, that's not always carried out as we know from the civil rights movement. I don't even have to say now all the things still going on that there's not that value that we say we have, the power holders don't always follow that. And they have rationales for why, or they hope nobody notices or whatever. And a lot of what the work that social movements do and a lot of what rebels are doing is calling people on where the stated values are not being carried out. So that was very clear in the civil rights movement and very clear in the women's movement and it's clear today in terms of how um, uh, transgender people are being handled and uh, all of that is, is just a good example of saying no to the violation of positive values. Any thoughts on that? Just, just unmute yourself and speak. I love joining marches. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not hard it doesn't take a lot of work and it's and they're fun okay so joining marches is one thing we're going to talk a little bit about a one-time march is how effective is that as opposed to building a campaign which is made up of a lot of things including marches but that's yeah a lot of people do like to do that, but it's important to really think about what's behind the march, what value is being, because values, I know this is another whole discussion, which we're not going to get into today, but people will fight for values in a way that they won't fight for policies. They will fight for the value, for instance, of uh, everybody gets a uh, one vote per person where they may not fight for a policy that um, is discriminatory because it's un much less clear. So people, you have to enunciate the values that, that are behind what you're fighting for. So uses nonviolent direct action. That's what NVDA stands for. And civil disobedience, or many people now are calling it civil resistance. Um, obviously, this puts problems in the public spotlight. We saw what happened after George Floyd's assassination and what happened on the streets. I live in a small town. It's always been Republican. And there was a call for a Black Lives Matter during that summer when everybody was doing a um, Black Lives Matter demonstration in downtown Mifflinburg, which has about six streets. And my husband and I thought, oh my goodness, maybe 20 people, we've got to go, even though it's in the middle of the pandemic. So we went down there and thinking there'd be 20 people, there were finally 600 people mm -hmm. who came to this small town. Mm -hmm. So clearly it was putting the problem in the public spotlight and people were responding. Um, so that is a lot of the positive. You get to see how many people really feel something. Um, and we'll talk about where where this in the street is most effective and why it, it happens and then it, it, it flows away as we know what's happened with Black Lives Matter. But it's you use can use being out on the street strategically when it's needed, not just because you feel like I'm mad and want to go out there, but because strategically it makes sense to be pushing out on the street at that moment. Penn, can you speak to the Gorilla Girls? And, and the how the arts play a part of the um, putting a spotlight on problems and being outrageous or theatric. Sounds like you could do a good job of doing that, Margaret. Well, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> you okay. know. So, so say a little, a moment more about the Gorilla Girls. What, what, 
what well, they you know i was i was so impressed by how you know they they would just show up and and they they had a very crafted you know content you know they they did speak to the values but it was always a surprise that showed up in the most conservative of environments so there was a bit of a shock value and i think it was about waking people up i, I was living in new york during the aids epidemic and so I remember a lot of that waking up that was needed and um, still is. And, you know, how to translate, you know, our community into a more purposeful, meaningful, you know, theatrical appearance right on the streets yeah. when you least expect it. And in a way that brings humor and joy or music, maybe that is a way of communicating that I don't have the courage to do. I need more of a community, you know, for that. I, th I think what you're saying is, is very true. And that is that the arts speak to people. And as I said earlier, we're not just talking about the power holders. We're talking about speaking to people and getting mm -hmm. people to see the issue and to wake up to the issue and to feel that they want to be a part of it. Yes. And that's where the arts come in. So I have a friend who does a lot of flash mobs and mm -hmm. um, in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And I would love to get something going in rural Pennsylvania like that. But here's a good example of you need people who are kind of grounded in the arts and understand how to do that and want to be a part of that. But I think it's very important because those kinds of shock value mm -hmm. and kind of which side are you on? You know, do, when, when something happens on the street, you're kind of maybe pulled up and like a little nervous and but it makes you have to decide, am I, which side am I on? Do I really think this or am I opposed to that? Or am I just scared and I, I don't, I don't get out and protest, but I, I agree with them. And you know, that that's important. Mm -hmm. very, it's a very important. In fact, there's a whole book on, um, forget the title of it, but I can get the title. Of it. It's a whole book on using the arts um, in terms of social change. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that was good. So ineffective. Obviously, there's a way that rebels can be ineffective. Um, let's see. Meredith, would you unmute yourself and read the ineffective part of a rebel? Self-identifies as being on the fringe. Any means necessary, including violence and property destruction acts from strong negative emotions such as anger, desperation, and powerlessness, anti-organization opposed to any rules or structure, personal needs outweigh movement needs. Thank you. So this is where things can get out of hand. Um, if people come to this work and not having done de dealt with their own inner anger, and this is a way to act out anger, this is not political work. This, it, under the guise of political work, people are acting out, and that does not help a movement. We've seen this time and time again when five or six people, and maybe they're agents provocateurs and set up to do this, but maybe they are just people who are in the group that go and, and, and break windows or mm -hmm. destroy something then suddenly all the attention you can have 2000 people peacefully demonstrating mm -hmm. and then two and then five people do that and all the, the front page says you know violence in demonstration etc so often unless they're agent provocateurs which have been set up and paid to do this often if it is from really from the people who uh uh, uh plan the demonstration, that's because of ineffective. Their anger took over. They wanted to be anti-opposed. Um, they had their, their, their strong, strong negative emotions and any means necessary, et cetera. So that's a negative direction, an ineffective direction that rebels can go in and groups can go in. And that's why it's very important when you're doing out on the street that there be pe people be trained and people be um, leaders, be there to keep sights on what you're out there for. This is not just a free for all to get your feelings out. Any thoughts about that? Oh, 
Okay, we're going to move on a, a, um, to the last one here, um, which is um, the, the we, so we've gone through the three of them, and now we're going to move on to um, the change agent. Um, I see that Helen, you have your hand raised. Yes. Yeah, so um, I will, there's the Berrigan tradition. Um, I'm not saying sure if I'm saying his name correctly, but Molly Rush, one of the founders of the Thomas Merton Center here in Pittsburgh, um, took part in, um, uh, they broke in and they basically hammered a missile. Um, it was, you know, it was to... So in that case, property destruction was part of a longer, well thought out campaign to really highlight the destructiveness of that object. You know, it was it was an object meant to deal out death. So I do think that there are forms of property damage, which if carefully considered and they're part of a, you know, a much larger, careful messaging and education and um, you know, overall campaign can be constructive and can be effective. Um, so I guess I would just worry about completely dismissing um, property damage as a potential constructive method if carefully considered very in a very respectful way um, with others who are you know trying to achieve longer term goals. Thank you, Helen. I think that's a very good point. Let me make a distinction. There's a distinction between the Berrigans and the Plowshares and a lot of other smaller groups that have done actions that have long-term been involved with the issue, have planned among themselves, carry it out very confined with just that group, make it very clear what they are doing. They've never destroyed anything where people have been hurt but they do destroy property. That is a different kind of action. It's not better or worse or anything. It's just a different kind of action than getting a large group of people from anywhere from 50 to 2000 people involved in some kind of a demonstration. Um, when that turns, when a large group of people get involved who've not thought about this a long time, worked together for a long time, planned it together, and that's where things can get out of hand with destruction, um, where somebody starts, you know, destroying one thing and then something else gets destroyed. And then people start thinking that's OK and their feelings get. Yeah. You know, that, and that, those are two very different kinds of situations. So I think that's very good that you brought that up. I'm going to respond to what's being put in the chat. So Simone Saul. Um, says, when marginalized people take to the streets to express their devastation and anger, do we consider them ineffective and police them within our protest movements? And Sierra writes, I think it is a privilege to be patient and act calmly and within, organize, within organizing. I'm not sure if I'm getting that right. Anger and violence as a reaction to state violence cannot be suppressed. So how do we allow space for them to? And I will bring up, so um, I've been a housing justice organizer for many years, and I've generally worked, you know, I was chair of the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Task Force. I was a commissioner on the Pittsburgh Commission on Human Relations. So I've taken part in some housing justice protests and planning out in the street with Penn Plaza Support and Action Coalition and within. But, so I, I will tell you as a commissioner, we fight to get the most basic civil rights uh, laws to be implemented by our, our local politicians it's it's such a fight the 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 reason that the fair housing act was passed i will say was largely fueled because martin luther king was killed and there was an uprising across the country of you know people that just who had been oppressed for so long rising up and rioting. And so Washington looked at that and they there's so much writing, so there was so much, there was fear that they had to do something. 
they had to make to actually pass the Fair Housing Act because there these uprisings were th that visceral response of grief and rage was so powerful. So I, I understand that your purpose here, you know, we're talking about how to build movements and we're looking at different roles. I just, I do think that respect does need to be given to those people who rise up in those moments. And, you know, that is also powerful and there is something to be respected about it. It's not my way, but I, I think that both Simone and Sierra raise really important points here. Thank you, Helen. And I was not looking at the chat, so please, I really appreciate you all sort of following that and bringing those up. And 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 feel free to also, if you want to bring that up, not just writing the chat, but to bring it up because it's 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 hard for me to see everything and what's on the screen. So, okay, I want to talk about that for a minute. Um, I think there, yes, you're right, um, Helen. This is about building a social movement. And that outpouring of anger that happened, that pushed the housing happened. And yet the housing stuff would not have, that, that what was passed would never have happened if there hadn't been a strong, very organized movement that knew what it was doing and was able to take that anger and put it into a really, push for what was needed because of the reformers had done their work the citizens had done their work you know what i'm saying all mm -hmm. of this had happened so that had a place that that extra push that came from that and frankly yes that's what happens we when when people do not have a place to put their anger and they have been oppressed i'm not going to get into internationally now but i we all have that in our minds that's what happens you know that is what happens what 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 we see and it happens at time and time again so langston hughes said it you know what happens to a dream repressed okay so that is there's no by stating that it's important to have a strong movement does not make any statement about what people do when they're pushed to their limits I hope that sort of answers both of that, that right now we're focused on the piece of it that's the organized piece, and it is not making a statement about what other people do when pushed beyond their limits. I do want to say something, though, which is that in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon, when a lot of that uprising was going on in Portland, Oregon, the African American community had to finally ask the middle class white community that was doing a lot of the destruction every night to please stop. So there is a difference also between those who've been oppressed so long that they up they, they they their anger just comes out and people who are just feel and I'm going to be kind of blunt about this, feel entitled that state people should be listening to them. And if they don't, they're just going to up the ante because they're pissed as hell that they haven't been listened to. Those are two very different things. And when you um, are part of a group that just feels like you know better and that you know, you're know you just going to do what you need to do and you don't care what other people in the movement are doing, that's more and what we were talking about the rebel over here. That's that. That's more of that kind of that. That comes from a privilege, not from oppression. So, and Pam, these dynamics that you're speaking of seem so consistently a part of human nature. Do we train teams of people to kind of come in and intervene at that stage of crisis before the fire starts, before the destruction begins? Uh, do we? Does the movement include people who are capable of? resolving that level of conflict, that anger before it erupts into material death and destruction? Within within our abilities, we do have training for peacekeeping. Yes. We do have training for that, but that does not answer. Peacekeeping answers 
what's going on in a demonstration or in an action that's happening where you want to keep the people who are there from being ineffective rebels mm -hmm. want to keep the people who are opposing you that whether it, whoever it is that's opposing from being inter intervening between the demonstrators and those who are opposing who want to use police actions etc mm -hmm. so that's a different issue okay keepers are not necessarily going to be people who will go out into the communities as Helen was bringing up that the other people brought up mm -hmm. that's a different issue that depends upon the people in their communities to do that and you know that's not always been successful within communities that have tried to do that mm -hmm. but yes the peacekeeping and training I mean people should be trained in nonviolent direct action people should not just take part which was not happening under you know, during the summer after uh, uh, the the assassination, the Black Lives Matter, a lot of training did happen, but there were a lot of people who were not trained. Yeah, because mm -hmm. when things when there's a trigger event that which we'll get into what trigger events are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to move on, and then we're going to because I I also want the other speaker to have time, so I'm, we're going to move on here. So change agent. Um, uh, let's see who is not uh, Kate. Would you unmute yourself and just read what's under change agent? Sure. Change agent uses people power, educates, convinces, and involves majority of citizens. Mass based grassroots organizing employs strategy and tactics for waging long term movements, promotes alternatives and paradigm shifts. Good, thank you. So the change agent, they're the networkers. They're the ones who know all the different groups who are involved and can go and talk with them and ask them to start working together. They're the ones who um, can help set up people to be able to go out into their communities and really speak with people who may not be already convinced of some issue, but how do you speak so we build our base larger? Um, they are the people who have a sense of when it's time to pull people together, when it's time to be quiet and help each, each group kind of build up their own ability to um, do their work. Those are the people who are the networkers. They're often not the people, as, you, as I said before, they're the ones behind the scenes more. They're then also not, often not the ones, so you often don't know, but those are the networkers. Any, anybody who has been a networker, can you speak to that? Just unmute yourself. I don't know if this strictly applies, but um, before I ran for school board, what I did is I sat down and I just decided to attend school board meetings and write down everything they said. And then I published it and sent it out and I started to build an email list and it really pissed um, off the school board <laughs> but um what it, it did is it it built a community around people who were concerned about what was happening on the school board as I was so that's exactly that's exactly it you, you cattle a person who is a catalyst to get something going a person who is able to bring people together around a topic. That's the change agent. Yeah, very good. Um, okay, the in, there's always ineffective, of course. So Tommaso, would you read the ineffective? Sure thing. <clears throat> change agent, ineffective. Uh, utopian, promotes visions of perfectionism disconnected from current movement needs. Dogmatic, advocates single approach while ignoring others ignores personal needs of activists, disengages from movement to live isolated alternative lifestyle. Okay, so I wanna in particular do this, uh, ignores personal needs of activists. This is not just the change agent. A lot of us do that to ourselves and each other, and it's very destructive. It's understandable, completely understandable. I live in an area out here where there are not many of us who are progressives who are working on different issues. And so if somebody says, oh, 
I need to take a break. You feel like, oh my God, that just means more work for the rest of us. So I understand why people don't either for themselves or others, but it is a very negative and very long-term destructive way of, of if when, when we do that, when we don't support ourselves and each other to take the time we need. This is a long haul. This is not a sprint. So we really need to take the breaks that we need. We need to step back when we, when we are tired. We need to be honest about what we can do and want to do and what we can't do and don't want to do. Though that that is hard to do, but it's very important because when we don't do it, we look like to other people outside like a group of tired wrung out people. <laughs> And that is not a, something that draws people in. You don't, you don't want to look like a group that is not having a good time and is overworked and is tired. That is not a good pull for bringing new people in. So it's not only as important to ourselves, it's important to the organizing that we do. So I just wanted to bring that went, that went out in particular. Any other thoughts about that, what I just said, or anything else about the ineffective? Just unmute yourself and please speak. I feel like I've been speaking too much, but I'm going to jump in again. Um, I That's something I really respect and honor about the solar punk movement in some ways and a lot of environmental activists that I have seen in different spaces. Um, the idea of dealing with climate grief and that we really have to center healing. Like we need to heal ourselves before we can heal the world. And centering that and ma and making sure it is okay for people like genuinely deeply okay for people to take care of themselves is so vitally critical in my mind. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you on, on that. Um, so it, it's a, a little before six. Um, I'm gonna suggest that we do another one of our stretches. And then um, when we come back, I'm gonna have Marin introduce, uh, Cadest, are you here? I, I'm trying yes. to- Oh, good, good. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to suggest that Cadest, um, are you are you okay for for speaking then and for talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I will definitely share with you all um, my experience with um, becoming a age um, a change agent, um, going beyond um, the the rebel to actually become an active um, a change maker. So, yeah. That's great. That's great. So um, stand up, stretch a little bit, do what you need to do. And then um, when we come back, Marin, if you would introduce Cadest and we'll, uh, she'll ex share her experiences. And then we'll, we have much more ahead, but I wanted to make sure that you uh, get on. So, um, okay. So stretch. Okay, Marin, I'll let you introduce how you found Cadest and introduce. I've had a chance to talk with Cadest. I'm so happy that she's joining us. Marin. Yes, so am I. Uh, I met Cadest fairly recently, no, quite recently, in a Zoom call. Uh, I think it was the Breathe Project uh, strategizing around um, an upcoming steel and coke uh, conference that's happening in Pittsburgh and um, we are going through a lot of these very questions what would be effective who are we talking to um, what what can we do what is what is in our in our scope of capabilities and in our capacity in an era when everybody is super busy and uh, worn out um, and and how to in, bring in involve uh, the most impacted communities by the um, fossil and petrochemical and steel making coke making uh, industries. So I'm not actually sure how Cadest wound up on that call. Possibly through Becca, I'm guessing, because Becca Economopoulos, who is um, part of a 
mobile natural history m museum, kind of an activist museum artists. Um, they were the ones behind uh, bringing the totem pole and the native presence to Pittsburgh last year um, in the clean, uh, what was it, the clean, the clean energy justice um, response to, again, to an industry conference about petrochemical industries. Um, and that was facilitated by uh, the Breathe Project. Let's see, is Matt still with us? I'm not sure he may have had to come and go. Um, and uh, and that is a local organization that we will be talking about next month, um, doing some long-term campaign work and a lot of strategizing. So at any rate, um, Becca uh, and her outfit um, have done a very um, impactful art and... Uh, it's an installation at the museum, but it's also an installation that is being done to outside of uh, industry facilities, polluting, damaging, climate shifting uh, facilities. And um, uh, that, but at the Carnegie Museum of Art, that's part of the um, unsettling matters, gaining ground uh, exhibit that folks might want to go see. It's in the Heinz Architectural Center part of the museum. And it is a lot about climate and petrochemical uh, pollution and um, impacted communities and public health and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at any rate, Becca, who has been connected with the Breathe Project uh, for working on these uh, cross-country things, um, evidently brought in uh, Cadest, who is involved, uh, I guess, the uh, communications and uh, campaigns director for the Black Appalachian Coalition, or Black. And um, uh, I've am very pleased to have to have this connection and especially when I learned that Cadest has done training in campaign development and movement training stuff um, in the past uh, the the training with the uh, the Center for story-based strategy and because stories are so powerful um, and that like the recent uh, Pennsylvania climate convergence had um, a whole, section on storytelling at the Capitol called the People's Climate Hearing, where impacted people and connection makers and all of us came together and shared our stories. And some policymakers came, I know of at least four out of uh, the entire legislature. There may have been more that I didn't recognize. And, but the information is being put in the front of, put in the face of, all of the policymakers, and um, uh, so so anyway, I am having learned that Cadest does this kind of thing. I thought, what a great compliment to what Penn is doing, because uh, you're going to have a whole different set of experiences, a whole different age range. Kate was talking about connect with people who are in different socioeconomic status and and ethnic and everything, and so here we have someone who. Uh, got her start working with the original, and the reason I keep saying the original Poor People's Campaign is that Cadest is involved with the people in the current Poor People's Campaign and and Reverend Marcia Dinkins. And so uh, take it away, Cadest. Thank you so much, Marin, for the nice introduction. Um, hi, everybody. So glad to see everyone in such a big turnout on a Sunday afternoon. Um, so it's, it's really great to see your beautiful faces. Um, my name is Cadesk Gabre, and I am currently the Communications and Campaigns Manager uh, at the Black Appalachian Coalition. Um, and be because I do have a short time with you all, I want to get really personal um, and tell you all a little bit about um, my work and how I came about to be an a, a, uh, agent of change, um, and really just a, a very much so activist, an activist. I try to connect people and arts and the cultural 
uh, cultural implications of the climate crisis um, to what's happening in our daily lives and how we can move forward um, to make um, changes, right? Um, so before I got to the Black Appalachian Coalition, I was with a group called Virginia Interfaith Power and Light. Um, it's a part of a national uh, movement um, that mobilizes people of faith and uh, faith leaders to really make a change into the climate um, space, right, to the climate change. Um, and what I really liked about that, that space was that we always started with the values, right? Like Penn was saying, you always want to start with people's values, where we can connect across lines, where we can find the common thread of Yes, I want a better future. Yes, I want clean air and clean water because most people don't debate that. Everybody wants that for their communities and for others as well, um, believe it or not. A lot of voters agree on that basis needs of um, the human rights to clean air, to clean water, to healthy our communities, right? Um, and so using that to kind of thread along, you know, our faith values of positiveness and leaving a better world, um, this idea of like creation care if you're if you're from the Abrahamic um, religions, right? Um, and also just the idea of like um, leaving a better future for our um, future generations. Um, that had a lot of resonance and we were able to work with um, a lot of Republican legislatures. Um, we were able to get into spaces that not a lot of people would get into. A lot, a lot of the nonprofits that were really um, on the line of like calling people out, really like instead of calling people in, um, weren't able to get into a lot of seats with legislatures because um, they would directly call them out, directly um, kind of in a sense attack, right? Um, the wrongdoings of a lot of these legislatures who in, in fact didn't even know better, right? A lot of times it's a lack of educational issue, but because we were able to connect with um, people's values and they're receiving a lot of calls, a lot of email saying, hey, this is a Virginia, I'm, I'm based from Virginia, by the way, um, this is a Virginian value, right? We wanna be able to um, um, be become aligned with a, a commonwealth that is safe for everyone. Um, and so that message, because it resonates with a lot of people, we were able to also then change a lot of the legislature heart and mind. And to, we were one of the first few states, I think we're still, a, a few states who were able to pass an environmental justice bill into the code. Um, and that came up to be by mobilizing frontline communities, right? We were an environmental justice grassroots organization um, that connected people of um, at different walks of life, right? Whether it be you're disconnected from this issue because it's not in your backyard, but you still care about the idea of justice um, and people's having the right to clean air and water. Um, and or if you were like the ones at the front line who really didn't know how to put in your experience into words. So we would mobilize them and do a lot of like training on um, storytelling, owning up to your climate story. How do you talk about your story, right? Um, and so we were able to galvanize uh, folks on the ground, folks, frontline communities um, to fight things like landfills, um, pipelines um, and power plants. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about some of the campaigns we were able to, to, to do together. Um, but that ultimately, all that mobilization, all the different tactics of doing prayer circles um, and also lobbying, <laughs> that was one of our tactics, right? And in, in, uh, street rallying, right? Uh, street protests, all of those tactics, talking to the press um, and doing like sit-ins and educational teach-ins, um, all of that. And, and really doing some of some intergenerational um, like organizing where we invite the youth to learn from the elders and the elders to learn from the youth and the to get to get passionate from the youth, right? Um, and all that work really resulted in us passing an environmental justice bill. Virginia now has a, a, a code that doesn't allow us to build any more fossil fuel infrastructure moving forward um, past 2024. Um, and all that came from on the ground educational and environmental justice issues um, and campaigns. Um, and one of the campaigns were uh, the Atlanta Coast Pipeline. Um, I don't know if you all, I know most of y'all have heard about the Mountain Valley Pipeline um, because it deals with the Inflation Reduction Act, but the Atlanta Coast Pipeline was proposed about the same time as the Atlanta Coast Pipeline. But thankfully the Atlanta Coast Pipeline was um, 
shut down and denied um, any more operation in the summer of 2020. Um, I was able to join that campaign in the summer of 2017. Um, I was just one of the rebels who were protesting no more new fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, and then I ended up um, meeting with uh, another black woman who was really doing the on the ground change agent making movement where she's talking to the landowners that are like majority black, um, black American. It was going through a freedom in black American community. And she was telling me, this is the story. And a lot of people don't know this story. Um, and, and a lot of the rebels who were on the streets just know that they don't want a pipeline, but they didn't know exactly um, the situation behind it, the powerful narrative behind um, this, this um, landfill, uh, not like uh, this pipeline. And so what we ended up doing um, was having one of the impacted folks just to come up and speak. And I was part of this, um, this organizing space that I didn't know was an organizing space, just talking about how can we um, use the arts to bring in more people to show up to these rallies. Uh, but I ended up uh, becoming part of the a strategy kind of meeting where we're talking about how do we organize the community. Um, and then from there on, I, I ended up interning there as a fellow, becoming a fellow there just to learn more about exactly how do you organize people um, to go beyond just shouting on the streets, but to make effective change that will last. Um, instead of saying no pipeline and then ending it there, how do we actually make sure this pipeline doesn't get built, right? Um, and so that looked like understanding the community, right? And and one of the things I'm sure Penn will, will go over in a little bit, um, and, and, and one of the key elements in communicating any kind of community-based issue, whether it be policy or a pollution project, um, is to know the audience, to know the community. And this is essential if you're not of that community. So if you're going across cultural lines and you know reaching out to communities of color, low-income communities, um, it's really important to know your audience, right? And this, for us in, in that campaign, looked like understanding this is majority uh, Black community, right? It was about 43 African Americans living there. They have a heritage of freedom and, you know, freedom and folks. So that adds another layer, right? Um, and then also we found out there was another yogi community there that settled in the 60s, right? And so there was that dynamic there. Um, it was a bunch of pastors that were of the Baptist tradition. And then we also found out the yogi community. So then because we were an interfaith organization, we decided to know how do we frame our issues effectively? Um, and that kind of came about beyond just understanding our communities. How do we get their attention, trust, really important, and their support? And that was just figuring out our framing of this issue, the messages that will resonate the most. And that was about you know, protecting your community, um, folks who really didn't understand what the yogis were doing, folks from the, the church who didn't know what the yogis were doing in that community, were now doing a prayer circle with them to talk about protecting the land, um, protecting patient care, which is that which is the framework that worked with the church community, right? And so, and with that being, then we started then talking to folks to use stories as sets of uh, as a way of in, uh, influencing folks, um, and as a way of grabbing other folks that weren't already kind of brought in from the values. Um, some folks were able to jump in because they see the value that connects with them, but some folks weren't really convinced just yet, right? And so that's where stories come in. Um, we were able to use stories of their neighbors first to um, really convince them that this is something they should care about. It's impacting them and their neighbors and their kids and their, their futures, right? And we were able to use the folks that were already convinced that this was a bad thing to share why they think it was a bad thing. Because as much as we want to deliver this message of like, you know, pollution projects are really bad or this policy is really bad, um, sometimes we may not be the right messengers. Um, and even though we get the message, we may not be the right messengers. So that's where also stories come in because then you have different messengers delivering your issue um, and, and communicating that properly. Especially when you're talking about justice and marginalization, it's all, that's when it becomes even essentially uh, more important because you would want to, to have that message coming from those directly impacted. 
Um, and that also later will help you um, become just a, 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 a change agent and not necessarily the activist who owns the whole story, who um, can only be the one who's making change. You're now then empowering people to feel confident in their stories um, and to feel empowered enough to organize even after you know, you're not in that community, working with that community anymore. Um, and so what happened within our campaign, once we started collecting stories, that's when the press started paying attention to this, this, to this pipeline, right? We started highlighting the fact that this is a freedom and community, instantly press are like clamming on it, trying to find out more why it was even, what is environmental justice? What does that even mean for Virginia? Um, and all of that, that conversation got sparked because people started telling their stories. Um, we were, uh, I don't know if you all are familiar with compressor stations, but compressor stations are where a lot of the pollutions from pipelines happen. This is where the blowouts of all those chemicals happen. Um, and a lot of them, a lot of compressor stations in the US and in, in Virginia as well are located in black and brown communities. And, and in this pipeline, it was going to be one of the biggest one in this in our in the state at that time at that time. And we were shocked to find out it was only 200 yards from an elderly person's home. So we ran with that. We, we started highlighting that. We started giving more time to this person who's going to be right in the face of this compressor station to tell her story, to empower her. And this was a three year campaign, y'all. So we, st we started in 2017 and folks were organizing before I got there since 2015, 2016, or maybe even 2014. Um, and then the, the, the fight finally came a close in 2020 when the press got involved, when community voices were raised up, um, when we were telling a specific messaging with this campaign. Um, and now that community currently is, um, they call themselves Friends of Buckingham. This was in uh, Buckingham, uh, Union Hill, Virginia, uh, a rural place. Um, and now this community is organizing with yogis and some of the Papu's folks. And they're currently working against gold mining um, in their community, which is something that they know now how to do. They know how to get that presentation. They're doing that on their own without the presence of my organization, you know, the organization that I worked for being there. Um, and so that is how we wanna be um, making changes. That's how you become an agent um, in, in change making because you would want to be the one to give people their voice, highlighting their stories, um, framing issues effectively, because that's where a lot of folks, they know that something is bad, they just don't know how to frame it, right? Um, and yeah, and, and to just avoid overloading your message and your campaign uh, with facts and data, they become important at critical moments, but using stories to really galvanize folks and to empower folks. And I know I have a little bit of time, so I'm gonna stop here um, and, and just see if folks have any questions. Um, and give the time time back to Penn. Well, there has been some, let's see, I'm going to add spotlight to the two of you. Um, there has been quite a lot of discussion in the chat. It's been, uh, I have a hard time interrupting <laughs> when something is going along so well, but there's a whole lot of other stuff that maybe we can um, can address. I'm not sure. Uh, how much of it is since the but while you're looking, Marin, I just want to say cadast, i I just get. Um, shivers up and down because you you put into real life what I'm about to you know what I've been talking to people about and what and that's where the excitement comes when you really can implement it and especially when you implement it really well and it works which is mm -hmm. what you've been involved and it's so wonderful that your organization is not only has the idea of what to do, but the idea of each one teach one. You know, we're passing this along. That's the important piece. And so I just, I loved your story. I just loved it. And I'm sure people have questions. I, I haven't been following the chat, so I guess, um, but are there questions that people have? 
um in the the bigger picture uh there's discussion of the value of electoral politics the advisability of third fourth party voting um and the question folks were also talking about the property destruction question um what's the difference between chaining yourself to a bulldozer and burning one um to which i offered the notion that burning one is more permanent but only for that machine chaining chaining yourself to a bulldozer only lasts until they unchain you burning one is permanent but they'll just bring in another bulldozer. So the rationale there would be to cost to cost money by the on the part of the company. And the question is, is are the consequences of doing that or is is that worth the consequences of doing that? Is that the best use of your energy? So that was one one line. And then the fringe position in electoral politics, whether to vote for the lesser of two evils. Um, Penn Hackney kindly posted a uh, piece by Noam Chomsky, which I have not had a um, chance to go look at, but I think he is in favor of voting for the lesser of two evils. Um, as far as I'm concerned, voting for the lesser of two evils is necessary because the more the greater of the two evils is not going to change anything and is probably going to make it worse. So um yeah, and Helen kindly brought in the uh question of when marginalized people in particular take to the streets. Um and Helen did interrupt. Um Thea has something to offer. Yeah, Thea and then uh, Simone. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I, um, I wanted to um, ask you about, um, you said this um, particular part of your campaign took three years. How did you keep people together? How did you keep them motivated and, um, you know, continuing on? Yes, um, that's a great question, Thea, and um, something that also that like I've been really re reflecting as you know the campaign was going was how can we still keep this, the same group going, right? And there were some basic things like calls and keeping calls, um, you know, consistent and keeping community consistent by doing events and and doing like uplifting events, but a lot of it was appreciating the small wins. Right. So um, we didn't get to that big win without multiple steps, whether that be at the beginning of uh, the permitting decisions, we might win a permit and lose a permit, but we're going to celebrate really hard when we when we uh, lose that permit. Right. Like when we when we get that denial of a permit, we celebrated, we created a community celebration event. Um, and when even when there were moments of like, you know, there's a halt of construction and there's like a lot of bureaucracy in the background and not a lot of movement is happening, we still connect with, uh, the community together through community events um, because that matters uh, to keep people together and keep that sense of community together. Um, so that's what we did, a, a lot of solidarity events. Um, we also, uh, in the between those times, we did a lot of trainings so that we can motivate folks to take takes this on their own, right? We didn't want to just hold on to that education and and, and be gatekeepers. Um, so in that in that quiet moment, we were preparing for when something big was going to happen. Um, and that looked like training folks um, to know more of the technical terms, um, to know more about the the way how public comment works um, and, and other small technical um, details, or even the larger things of like, what is climate justice? Like, wh where do we fit in in this context of like larger climate movement? Um, and we're just a small, you know, rural community in Virginia. Uh, but what does it mean? What does this pipeline, uh, what's the implication of this pipeline to the larger um, climate crisis? And what is the climate crisis? Because these were a lot of rural Black folks who 
um, didn't have that education, didn't, didn't really understand that. So that's how we were able to um, keep the community together. Okay, and Thank Simone. Thank you. Simone? Yeah, um, thank you so much for sharing your experience um, and stories. I was curious about, um, you said that you're able to change the the code in Virginia around fossil fuel infrastructures, which is like amazing, incredible. And I'm, I don't know a lot about Commonwealth code. Um, Pennsylvania is also a Commonwealth, so I'm very curious, like, what levels of government you were um you were lobbying and like what what would it take for them to overturn that or like how how solid is that compared to a regular like state law yes so um virginia is weird in the sense that the commonwealth laws are done through legislature the same way how you would pass a legislative code um so we were able to and we're also weird in the sense that um we have elections every year. So that makes a lot of like these legislative legislative changes um, like kind of fleeting and almost subject to change every other year if you lose that that champion for you know environmental laws. So what uh, we've been doing um, is simultaneously educating legislatures and we did the same thing. We use stories instead of facts because legislatures sit through a bunch of meetings and what stays with them is not the 1 million number or like the 200,000 number that you were telling them. What stays with them is that, you know, that person or that ho uh, homeowner um, or that um, impacted community member coming in and saying, hey, um, you know, I'm paying too much in electricity bills or this pipeline is going to destroy uh, my 100 plus year land that's passed down for generations to me. Um, and those are the stories that stick with legislators. So a lot of um, the work that we did was um, lobbying with community members. So we um, set up the meeting, we train community members, um, and then we bring them to the room, um, in a sense, bring them, you know, bringing folks to the table. Um, and then we give them that moment to talk to legislators. And we were able to gain about 15 champions. So we're like, okay, at different levels, we get that we need to stop fossil fuels from, you know, polluting in our commonwealth. Um, so we were able to uh, able to get a Republican um, and a Democrat to co-sponsor um, this, you know, this code into the commonwealth. Um, and, you know, we did a lot of like um, presentations and storytelling with our community members and it was able to, to pass. Um, but we do have an anti-climate um, governor right now, and, and there is a chance that this could be vetoed, this could be changed. Uh, other legislature is continuously, since this passed in 2020, we have seen and defeat, like, defensed a lot of um, bad bills that were attacking this legislature as well. So this is something that, you know, with system change, when you're trying to make a systematic change, um, you're gonna have to roll with where the wheels fall. Uh, <laughs> and we, we got, we got, um, we got we kind of got bad luck um during the governor race so so we're trying to work you know even with him to make sure that uh, we find common threats and um and even then you know he still supports um a lot of like uh we have a, a we're a utility monopoly state um and and he's very anti monopoly which is you know it kind of also supports our cause of making sure people have fair energy bills that's where we have the threat now um, but we're still defending a lot of uh, bill, bad bills attacking um, our, our code that protected us from um, fossil fuel build out. Mm -hmm. One uh, question, uh, quick question that came up in the chat is whether Virginia uh, has a similar problem that we have here where the committee chair um, can prevent bills from going out. No, no. Or even um, prevent bills from being heard in committee. No, no, they can't do that. Um, that's not, uh, that's really crazy. Um, yeah. It <laughs> is. In, in Virginia, if, if that bill is up for hearing, unless there's a uh, something major changes, like a, there's a sub that's going through the bill 
um, they need to substitute something or they there's a new substitute that's been introduced and they're trying to like find the common ground between the original bill and the substitution unless something like that happens which then the chair can say until we find common ground then we can't hear about this bill that is the only time in in virginia uh the legislature can decide not to um hear a bill but that is also in agreement with the person who uh, is patroning the bill and, and introducing that bill mm -hmm. um they cannot just um prevent bills being from being mm -hmm. heard in virginia Okay. Uh, comment. Um, uh, Susan loves the focus on stories bringing people together, and then that community, after it's formed, is itself a change agent, and that's just yeah. a fantastic way to look at it. Um, okay. And Margaret. Okay. Um, I, I'm I'm so grateful to hear the power of stories and how you used it. And my my question is, um, the power of stories and the power of the stories that the lobbyists take. You know, if you had to weigh them, where's the greatest influence? Who's listening to the uh, emotional contents? How do you sway the legislators when it seems that the lobbyists, what are they, cutting deals? It's a financial kind of conversation. It's transactional rather than a kind of psychological, emotional, human appeal. How does that work? Please forgive yeah, me. Yeah, um, that's a great question and, and something really, really hard to, to kind of cut through because um, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, I was working on uh, a disconnection protections bill. One of the things that Virginia really lacks um, is that we don't have whenever we have extreme weathers, we don't have any protections for low-income families or people um, that are struggling to pay their bills to kind of have a cushion of not getting their power or water or gas cut off. Um, they just automatically do that. Um, and some some utilities do have good faith and, and they do give you some cushion before they cut it off. But we wanted to change that, right? Change that bill, that code in, in, through a bill. Um, and, you know, this was a very, you know, the framework that we used was that Folks shouldn't have to um, debate whether or not to spend their uh, monies on a light bill or their groceries um, or their coats um, during the you know the winter times. Um, and a lot of families who do have infants, you know, and, and elderly, they just need basic protections, right? Um, and we invited a lot of folks. We were um, uh, on the public press um, talking about how some of folks, some, some low-income families. We're dealing with astounding bills like 2,000, uh, 5,000, 7,000 just in water or energy bills. And we got these folks, uh, whether it be anonymously or you know in, in person to come and share these stories. Um, we had some folks on TV and, and, and so on, right? Especially when you're thinking of like, you know, press um, press folks would love to talk about like what's hot in that, in that, in that season. And when it's winter time, you know, people going cold is always going to catch people's attention. Um, and we were able to convince some of our legislature through those stories, right? Um, and we were strategic enough to um, reach out to publications that are like in communities where some of the legislatures weren't like pretty convinced. So when these stories were being published, they were like in their news uh, papers or in their neighbors' newspapers. Um, and we were able to convince some folks. Um, and then once it was time to do a stakeholders meeting where we're inviting different utilities, um, some of the utilities were claiming that they do this already. It's in good faith that it doesn't need to be in the code because they are already doing it. Um, and our response was, if you're already doing it, then being, you know, having it in the code shouldn't hurt that much. Um, and that when we found a common ground through language and, and so on, and when it was time to vote on this bill, after all the lobbying efforts, um, you know, one of our co-patrons received a text from one of the utilities in between break time. And then they were like, we're gonna pull this bill. I don't want it to be hurt today, right? And that was really heartbreaking. And it was, it was very frustrating because at that point, um, this was a Republican person. They weren't convinced, they, and then we convinced them enough to patron this bill, co-patron this bill. Um, just for them to kind of, you know, change their mind last minute. And and those things happen. Um, and, you know, and th this also to emphasize Payne, uh, Penn's point about campaigning, 
can take a long time. It's not just a win or lose and then you give up, right? Um, we were able to gain a lot of support for the for this issue and for the bills that we introduced. That was a win. We were able to get this out in the public space. That was a huge win. People were talking about this as an issue. Um, we were able to change some voters' minds, right? Um, and those were wins that we were able to carry it away and then um, and, and gracefully take some of the losses of not being able to win this in the code. Um, and we, we've been, um, as far as I can tell you, we've been trying to pass this bill for three years. Um, so uh, I think going on fourth year now. So um, yeah, I, I, I think as much as you can tell stories, as much as you can try to persuade people because numbers don't persuade folks, especially people who are decision makers, um, people's stories, um, and a lot of these folks are decision makers are not trained in climate science. They're not climate scientists. They're not even close to being scientists. They could be working at a whole nother day job. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to talk about the, the peopleness of this, the, the people issue um, at, at the heart of this, right? Um, and and take some of the wins because you definitely, the lobbying and the monies and, and, and the corporate, um, the corporate definitely, have their their big hefty pockets to to have um, some wins, but you have to also recognize you have people power and and just uh, um, and always hold on to that always. Yeah, S getting stories and getting uh, kids' stories are particularly powerful um, because they can't vote, uh, but they're the ones who are going to be living out the future that we create. So, uh, and young people in general, of which you are one. <laughs> You're very easy compared to some of us. Um, yeah, any other questions for Kittist or shall we, ah, oh, another one. Uh, do you see any connection between your pipeline campaign and the Standing Rock pipeline history? Yes, absolutely. Other than the fact that they were happening um, in, in tandem, right? Um, the fight in, in Standing Rock um, was happening at the same time as uh, the fight with the Atlantic Coast Pipeline at, at, certain, at, at certain aspects. Um, and what we were um, trying to pull into was the fact that this is an environmental justice issue. Um, this is where I believe the Atlantic Coast Pipeline was definitely the catalyst to embedding an environmental justice law into Virginia. Um, because we were able to make comparison to what's happening in Standing Rock um, and how, you know, indigenous peoples and, and their right to their land and, and being able to uh, be at the margins of, you know, in our society and still having to fight um, to keep some of, you know, their land um, and how that ties into um, the black folks in Virginia that are like at the, at the front of, at the front line of this Atlantic Coast pipeline fight that are, that were able to gain their freedom and their um, their freedom of their families through the Atlantic, uh, through buying this freedom and land. And now this Atlantic Coast Pipeline is, you know, threatening that freedom. So there was this, the, um, this up uplifting of the connection of environmental justice and the struggles for environmental justice between both communities. And then highlighting what is environmental justice? What is, uh, why are we talking about the fact that racial justice is an important part of the, env the, the environmental movement um, and bringing to the, the front front that a lot of black and brown and indigenous communities are uh, being targeted for these polluting projects and have been targeted for these uh, pollution projects um, and really highlighting that. And, and, and something that I am finding out about Pennsylvania, right? And, and um, Marion shared a little bit about this earlier um, is, you know, the Met Coke problem in Pennsylvania and the petrochemical build out in Pennsylvania. If you really look at that, um, a lot of these plants are located in low income rural communities and black and brown communities. Um, and so there's always going to be a thread and a connection um, between all climate justice campaigns. Um, and, and, and we found that out about the Atlantic Coast Pipeline campaign and the Standing Rock campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, two different communities, separate communities, separate geographical locations and terrains, um, but there's always justice was at the heart of it. Um, and the injustice of these pipelines were was also at the heart of the thread that we were able to make connections. 
Uh, okay, I think we have caught up. Um, yeah, the the whole idea of environmental justice or environmental injustice is if you are a corporation, you're not going to want to fight off rich people's lawyers. You're going to go where people can afford to fight off uh, a facility. And then the people, they, they also can't afford to move away. So uh, it's... Uh, something that is the at the core of of the climate movement and the environmental movement overall is because it's not the um, the people in power are not the ones who are suffering so thank you so much for sharing your story and your perceptions of how stories can be um utilized and have great strength in the movement in spreading the movement and expanding the movement to engage more people um and i see a lot of sparkly hearts floating around the screen <laughs> uh but i guess we thank you so much for jumping in here and uh coming to to join this discussion the next uh salon will be on november 12th and you know if you can make it then too, but we'll be in touch. And I know you had a busy day today with family stuff and other stuff. So thank you for making time. And I guess at this point, uh, uh, and you're certainly welcome to stand as long as you can. I'm, you will have lots of good observations. And um, uh, but now we'll turn it back to Penn. Kadesh, thank you so much. I know you had, I, you and I talked and I know you said you had to leave by about quarter of seven. So we got, we got you in here, right? At the right so, time. so and, serendipitous. Yes. And I so, knew, knew so now your story would really flesh out everything. So that was really good. Thank you so much. And we, you and I will be in touch. And I think if you can come back on, on the 12th, that'd be great because yeah. we're really, on the 12th, we'll be talking about campaigns. Uh, right now, I'm going to go into the different stages of a campaign, but we'll be talking about campaigns, wh what has worked, where you get bogged down, where, you know, and that's a really important piece of it. Yeah. Um, and and you, we may, um, and right before then is when it sounded like you might be coming up for the uh, the Met Coke uh, counter protest. And hey, <laughs> stay on and <laughs> or remote works too but um if you want to hang out in pittsburgh for a while although penn is far away so we will be and it will be too cold to hang out in person on my back <laughs> porch but uh yes, but at absolutely. any rate i look um, forward to meeting in person at any rate and we can certainly yes, be in yes, touch. Yes, I, I was just about to say that um, I'm taking that opportunity to meet as many people in Pittsburgh as, as I can. So um, I'll definitely see you then. Well, I know a lot of them, so I'd be happy to uh, help with that bit of connection making. So, okay, thank, thank you, you um, again. And uh, we'll turn it over to Penn to okay. uh, finish this up. Do you want you big or everybody view we still have no just a view of everybody's fine okay. yeah okay so i'm so glad that you got to hear somebody who has been involved with a campaign because now when i give you sort of the different steps that a campaign goes through it's gonna have more uh it'll it'll sink in more because you've heard a lot of the stuff and we'll sort of be referring to some of the stuff that cadest has done so the the um, I'm going to share my screen. And once again, don't take notes because this will all be um, in the... Uh, in some keeping in, track of who was here. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> my little check-in list. Um, so I'm going to bring us to where we stopped here. Um, and... Um, okay. Movement action plan. So... This comes from the chart I was telling about uh, my friend Bill Moyer and the different, he really observed many, many movements in the past and when he was alive and involved. 
And I've never seen one that has not really um, stayed within this. It, 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 these stages give you an idea of what you can sort of have as a framework so you know where you are. And when you know <coughs> where you are, you know what you need to do and you know what's required. So we'll go through um, much more slowly all of this, though I know in terms of time, I, I'm, I'm aware of the time. I'm not going to go beyond eight o'clock, I promise you. So, um, but I'm just going to go sort of very quickly through so you can kind of see. As I said, there are different stages and at each stage, it, there is a beginning stage where no one's thinking about a problem. And then the second stage where more people are involved in it. If you want to think about the um, climate movement with, with this, I'm going to take that one because many of you are involved with that, though you, you, in different movements, you can really start looking at this. When Rachel Carson wrote the book, Silent Spring, most people had nowhere on their agenda of that climate. Activists, environmentalists, there were some people, obviously she, she, she was thinking about it, but that's kind of normal times when, when people are not thinking about an issue. Um, and then and then there's proofs of failure. I mean, that's what her book was. Her book was really something that got people thinking about it. And so that it starts to build more. And then you have on the stage three here, with you have ripening conditions. You have more people being involved. Can you see my arrow? Just let me say yes. Where my arrow is. Is that working, Marin? Yes. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay. So and and then you, you then the takeoff. Something happens. Something uh, if, obviously with Black Lives Matter, we know. Um, but something happens and there's a takeoff. Then from there you go into often people feel like after the takeoff, it dies down. People are out on the street in the takeoff, then it dies down and people feel like there is a failure going on. It's not. Really, you should just miss this one, this sense of failure and go right to majority, um, the public opinion. And that's, we're gonna talk a little bit at the end of this evening, we're gonna talk about that one because that in my opinion is where we are in terms of the climate movement. And this is, the most detailed, the longest one, and in some ways, um, the most complex. And that's where we are right now. And then you go into um, success and continuing to make sure that whatever you won in terms of um, legislation or changes of attitude get consolidated and continue. And I'm going to say, I was around and involved with the um, 65 um, legislation with voter rights and so forth. And we sort of, we made a mistake, which is um, we, I mean the movement, um, a progressive a liberal movement that was pushing for these rights. We sort of felt like, okay, that's done. Now we can take our eyes off that and look to something else. And that was a major mistake. That's something that I think we should never do again, which is once things are consolidated, it doesn't mean that those in power are happy with it. So um, that's one of the things. Um, so I'm going to sort of move along here um, and have us look a little more carefully at, at, at each one. Because as I said, once you start understanding the, the, the stages that movements go through and what, what is needed, it all is a lot clearer in terms of what is the work that needs to be done. So this is the normal times. Once again, I'm gonna go back to the issue of, um, let's see, I'm gonna, I, I think, I'm not gonna have people read, I'm just gonna talk a little bit through this. In the normal times, one of the first things that you bring up is once again, that the official policies are not really what people are saying. Like we believe in, um, uh, it's in our con in a Pennsylvania constitution, right? We believe that people have the right to clean air, et cetera. But is that being followed? No, but that's the kind of thing that needs to be pointed out starting in normal times when it's not even an issue and going all the way through the values that are being violated it's a really important thing to point out. Um, 
So there are a lot of issues that are now starting um, in normal times and are, are in different parts of a movement can be in different places. Um, so prove the failure of official institutions. So many, um, there are more groups form and we can, if you think back and any, and any or organizations that you, when did they form? More groups start forming. Um, you start using official channels. Um, uh, become, you have start to have people who are expert on something and do research on it. That's what starts to 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 build a movement. We'll talk a little bit more about research, and I and I think that's one of the places that if you are a researcher and you like to see how things fit together, a couple of you mentioned this. It is crucial that you do this because a lot of people don't. They don't want to do the research. And so sometimes research doesn't get done and our movements are weakened because of lack of that. So if you are somebody who likes to do research, please all in normal times improve the failure. And in the following one, researching and having the facts and the data are really important. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in terms of power mapping, but this is an important piece of the research. So ripening conditions here, recognition of the problem, more and more people are speaking out. Um, Marin referred to what happened at the climate convergence just the, uh, last month in, in um, here in Pennsylvania. More and more people are speaking out. You're making the victims visible, giving them a face. Um, so this is um, important because, and, and um, um, Kadesh referred to this. Conservatives, and this is another whole issue about how conservatives and, and progressives think differently. Progressives are moved by facts and figures. We're moved by downwind what happens and uh, uh, the, the uh, amount of uh, increase in um, uh, disease that happens. That is not what moves conservatives. Conservatives are moved by personal stories. This happened to my family, and this was the result. That, that there's a, a lot more that I could go into, but I just want to mention that. And and Cades talks about that. That working with the uh, legislators that she needed to work with, that they needed to work with, giving them the facts and figures. And she said that's not what changes them. It's the personal story. So this is where the people who are telling what's really happened to them is important. <laughs> important, the data is important, but not necessarily when you're communicating. That's not necessarily part. I don't know who there, somebody who has their, their um, if you would mute, there's been some noise coughing and so forth. Thank you. Um, so the ripening conditions, that's where about 20 to 30% of the public is opposed to what's going on. That's a small amount, but it's not an insignificant amount. And this is also where you start to have people during during the ripening conditions, you start to have people starting to protest, to be out um, with their legislators or on whatever level um, that they're protesting. Takeoff, trigger event, a dramatic event that happens. You never quite know. Three Mile Island here years ago, I'll tell a story. There was a group of us who were trying to stop Diablo Canyon um, from being built. And we had all sorts of research and all sorts of things. There was nuclear power plant in, in Southern California, in California, and all sorts of research and so forth. And the first year we demonstrated, we had 50 people. The second year we demonstrated, we had 157 people. And then Three Mile Island happened. And it happened at the same time that a movie had come out um, called The China Syndrome. And in that movie, they said, well, if that happens, you could lose an area like the state of Pennsylvania. This happened be right before Three Mile Island. When Three Mile Island happened, we went from 157 people to over 2,000 people who came. We couldn't train people fast enough to do demonstrations at the, at the um, uh, uh, power plant that we had planned. So the takeoff, you never know. You have to be ready at any time. Who knew that Eric Garner could happen and many other people were, were murdered and suddenly 
George Floyd's uh, uh, situation happened and boom, it took off. So take off, you never know, you always have to be really prepared for it because um, you quite never know quite when that's gonna happen. But the trigger event is one that then makes people out on the street. That's the visible one. That's the one that you see. And, but as you all know from what happened with the George F Floyd demonstrations, and that is that it'll happen very quickly to start and very quickly to end. And that's where the perception of failure happens. You think, wow, we're almost there. You know, we almost have it. And, and, and there's a perception of failure. This one, the X is because that one does not have to happen. You can go straight from the takeoff, the trigger event, to knowing that it's now time to do the majority public opinion. And this is, as I said before, this is the area where we are right now. We're gonna look more closely at this area because stage six is where we are right now in terms of the, the overall um, environmental movement. But you can go right from takeoff, miss that whole being disappointed and so forth. And I don't know how many of you felt that way, but you can miss that and go right into the majority public opinion. Um, so I'm gonna stop here and just open it up to comments so far about what you've seen, your own reactions to some things that maybe you fell into the, um, you know, feeling disappointed and feeling like there's failure going on. So I'm just gonna open it up. Anybody who wants to please talk. I was just going to say, it's it's really helpful to see this model. I, I don't know if I've seen it in the past before, but if I have, I forgot it. But it's just, you know, w when you're going into this as an organization, you, you kind of feel like you're you're floating on the ocean and there's no, no, no land in sight sometimes. But this gives you a sense of, you know, finding, okay, here's where I am now, but look at all these other things that could come up or, you know. Um, so thank you for, for putting that out there. It helps out. Great, thanks, Jim. Anyone else thoughts on this? Well, I really I, like the idea that you have to, like you don't know when the takeoff's gonna happen. So you have to build and build and build and be ready because something will, I mean, we're all working on important things. Something will happen eventually. And there's a little bit of faith there that I think can be hard to hold on to sometimes, but that's this model is really great for that. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, Susan. And that's where all the work comes in. You know, what we see is the just the we see the demo, we saw the demonstrations in the women's movement, or we see the demonstrations, you know, it with the with 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 whatever movement it is. That's what a lot of people only see that all the work that goes into it and being ready for the takeoff or the trigger event is really critical. That is what builds a movement as opposed to people just getting out on the street because something happened and they're mad in hell and they want to protest. That's fine, but that is not what builds and makes for social change. That contributes, but a one-off demonstration may feel good, but does not build. All this work is what builds. And we're gonna go into more detail in terms of, of where we are in stage six. Um, any other thoughts? Margo, Margaret, you had to. Well, uh, you know, I almost hate to admit it, but you know, I, I am discouraged. I'm at that, you know, stage where after all these years of, of watching, you know, and whatever I was able to contribute, I just feel like, maybe I'm just burnt out, you know, this compassion fatigue that sets in after a while when you, you see the situation more complex rather than simplified or whatever actions you took, you know, it's 40 years later and you're mm -hmm. basically still taking the same steps. Yeah. And it didn't prevent the crescent of fracking. And it, it, I mean, all the stories of all the 40 years didn't stop you know, the fossil fuel from its marketing campaign, uh, you know, so I, I am needing a, a, a somehow a boost <laughs> of faith right now that it's really the next 10 years of my life, I'm going to be 70. The next 10 years of my life will have some impact, but then they say you do it because it's right, not because of the results. 
that's interesting to me. Yeah. Well, you, you brought up a number of things. First, I just want to say thank you for being honest that you feel that way. And sometimes we don't admit that because we're afraid if we admit that we feel overwhelmed or like, why did we bother even doing what we did or uh, that somehow that's going to weaken us? It doesn't. Acknowledging what we're feeling is really important. And so that that I want to say that's first thing. Second thing is there are two ways of looking at an issue. One way is I call eagle vision and one way is mouse vision. Mm -hmm. If you're working in an organization, you are probably doing mouse vision, which is think about a mouse. You have your eyes right in front of you, the work that needs to be done, the funding that needs to happen, the organizing that needs to happen. You are looking day to day, right at like a mouse right in front of you. Eagle vision means that you are up in the air and you can see the long haul that it's been, the people who came before you and the people who you are working with and many, many different issues that are related. And you also see all the way that you are part, only a part, you're doing your part while you're on this planet to move society forward. That's an eagle vision. Mm -hmm. And so many of us spend so much time when mouse vision with good reason, I understand why we all need to do that. I'm not saying don't do mouse vision because that's what gets the work done. But we need to take the time as individuals in our, if you have a spiritual practice or with friends or in, a gr in your group, in your organization, we need to take the time to look at the whole eagle vision, which is we are doing our part. Sometimes yeah. our part is gonna move things forward Sometimes our part is only going to hold the line where it is. And sometimes we're going to get pushed back, but we're going to be able to grow and make sure that we're able to bring it back to where it was and then move forward. So many of us, I know I often feel that feeling of, oh my God. I mean, I worked with talking about racism and diversity and everything. I've been doing that work since I was 20 and I'm in my seventies now. So yes, I can feel like, oh my God, am I still, but I know that we have moved forward and I know that what is important is to make sure that I am doing what I can, which involves Margaret, which involves really looking at do I need to take a break and do I need to step back? If I'm feeling overwhelmed or I'm feeling stuck or I'm feeling like too angry most of the time or whatever it is that I'm feeling, then I know I need to step back. And that is an important piece. I said that earlier. We need to step back when we and we need to be aware when we need to do that and help each other do that. Yeah. So Thank I don't know you. if it's at all helpful. Yes. Any to other that, about well, this? To that point, um, the other pen remarks uh, about tikkun olam, the Jewish way of saying the world needs fixing and it's our job to fix it. And in the words of the Talmud, it is not upon you to finish the work, but you are not free to ignore it. Yes, exactly. And, Very well said. Yeah. yeah. And I've heard that lots of places. I didn't know that was where it was from. But, uh, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and there, there are many, I mean, I, whenever I feel discouraged, I think of a couple of things. I think of Mamie Till, Emmett Till's mother, mm -hmm. <laughs> who in the fifties, her son's just been killed. And in the fifties, things were not moving ahead with the, with racial justice and uh, et cetera. And she said, no, I want an open casket. No, the mm -hmm. world will see. She held the line right there. And from that grew a huge number of people who were affected by that. Um, individual people um, uh, were affected by it when they, when they actually realized the courage that it took for her to do that. Um, and um, also the, peop the, the public in general had to be faced with that. So we all can play our part, no matter how discouraging it may seem. And there are many things to be discouraged about. Believe me, I am not. I am not saying that there are not. Um, I'm going to move forward if that's okay, unless somebody else yeah. wants. 
thank you for for watching Marin. thank you mm -hmm. for watching the it's intermittent because it's getting dark here and i still have plants outside so oh, i'm okay. moving around with my phone a little bit okay but Good. i'm trying to pay attention and come back to the computer when i can be useful <laughs> good so okay susan you had a, something yes just real fast i wanted to add to folks that when i get frustrated um i try to remember that i actually don't know what the impact of my actions are um you when you're doing things that because it's the right thing to do and you're moving forward and you're trying and you're contributing and you're doing all the things that you do because we are all super, super into this. Um, you actually don't, you're you're not actually a very good uh, assessor of the impact of your actions. You don't know because it may be down the road. It may be somebody who hears about the salon, you know, goes back and watches the recording later. You don't know. Like, I think it's really easy for us to think that we know oh, I did X and this was the result and then all that there ever will be. And so therefore and it didn't work. And so therefore we're done. And that's like not actually how the world works. We're all very super connected. And when we're all doing our part, somebody else sees you doing your part and they go off and they may never even tell you. So just wanted to thanks. throw that out. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Yeah, I think it's important and it's important to share with others what keeps us going because when when you have a sense of being able to 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 do things you're going to work much more effectively than if you feel like oh god i just have to do it anyhow no matter how i feel that's not a good way to be working so majority public opinion as i said we're going to go in a little bit more but I, one of the things that i really liked about what cadets talked about is that they built community they saw that their work was educating the community and building the community and, and then teaching them, being mentors to them to be able to do this kind of work because they gave them the tools, just like we're doing tonight. They gave them the tools to use to do the organizing. That is critical. So we can kind of get lost thinking that all of our work is about pressuring the hires up and the you know people in power. No, that's only a small piece of the work. Really the work is about growing the group of people who know about and are skilled in doing and making the changes that are needed and be part of the change. That's and a majority public opinion, the, the, the stage six that we're in right now, and we'll talk more about this, that is a huge amount of the work is, is to do that. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna continue here with this. Um, you can see that this is a lot of where we do push pressuring of, this, of, this, of the power holders here. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about power holders, who they are, et cetera. So stage six, as I said before, it takes a long time. It's the most complicated, it's the longest one, it's the one we're in now. It's not as juicy as you know the, the out on the street one, but it does, if we do it right, it leads to success. Whereas larger numbers of people oppose the policy. Once again, you're always talking about where our values are in conflict, what we say and what we really do. Many power holders start splitting off, you'll start seeing that. Um, and um, what, once again, you, speaking to the power holders um, is, is part of it, but only a small part. And the other, and I mentioned this before, continuing the struggle to promote the paradigm shift and to oppose attempts at backlash. That's what we did not with, do with the civil rights movement. The backlash started immediately and we were not there keeping, sh making sure and keeping our eyes on the prize and making sure that that backlash didn't happen. And that's something, at least I, for one, feel I've really learned from, um, you know, from what we've done. An important part about continuing the struggle. Um, and there's there always, you know, life is such, there are always gonna be issues, there are gonna be changes we want. So those are the eight basic eight stages um, that, um, that we are looking at. And we're gonna look a little bit more here at the characteristics of movement process. 
So social movements are made up of sub goals and sub movements, and each of them have their own, go through their own stages. Um, uh, for a minute, think of some sub goals or sub movements that are within whatever movement you're working in. Right? We've talked a lot about environmental, but it could be something else. Think a little bit about what are sub goals or sub movements, smaller ones within your movement that are happening. Anybody? Getting a permit overturned. Okay, now, but, 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 a thing. When I'm thinking about this, that is that is an issue. Yeah, I'm um, getting a permit over overturned. But think think about your movement for a minute, and think about what are the different pieces that go into um, your the work that you're doing. What are the different pieces? So it, it it could be, you know, if you're doing litigation, it could be, you know, getting sp uh, special experts to testify. Right. Okay. So the litigation part is one, and that takes a lot of work. You've got to get the people together. You've got to, I mean, there's a huge amount of work that goes into that. That's one piece. At the same time, you are probably also trying to reach out if you have enough people, and this does depend upon the number of people. So I, I, I realize this is what you hope is can happen. You also are reaching out to people who've never heard about the issue. That's another piece that's going on, okay? And you are also helping to do research and finding out in your community, you need to find out a number of things. In your community, you need to find out who runs your community? Who's on the city council? Who's the mayor? What are they connected with? What are their beliefs? Who maybe has some connection with the company that is bringing in whatever it is? You know, that's that. That's, so there are many different pieces that are going on in the civil rights movement. There was the 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 um, lunch counters. There was the bus rides. There were the schools, you know, James Meredith, who's integrating, there are all sorts of different aspects. Every movement has different pieces to it. And it's important to be aware of that and sort of be aware of how they all fit together. Um, so the public must be convinced three times. There are th the, uh, the first time is that there is a problem. That's when you first start to educate the public. Then there's also in stage four, six, and seven, in these other stages, you have to keep educating people. You can't just focus on the, 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 the um, power holders. You have to keep educating people. And in stage six and seven, when people, there are alternatives and there is less fear of the alternatives, and we started are starting to see that with with um, in the uh, environmental movement that there's more of an understanding about uh, methane and what it does and what we what's happening at schools and 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 that that there all are alternatives to the fossil fuel industry. You can do things um, mitigation and and. Uh, um, uh, solar panels and heat pumps and et cetera. They're starting to be, so you have to, there's, there are different times at which you really are pushing people um, in, the, in the communities to have more knowledge and to be more aware. And, and Cadets brought that up a lot. You know, that was a lot of the work that they were doing was really um, doing that kind of um, pushing and making sure that people were aware of what was going on and able to pass that information along. So let's take a look at the power holders here. There are many different times that you're pushing the power holders. We're gonna take a look at who are the power holders and how to sort of look at them. Um, uh, because in each situation, it may be somewhat different, but a regime or the status quo, whatever it, it, it is, depends on usually at least seven pillars, and there may be more. And this is part of the research you need to do on your topic. So uh, the pillars are, if you think of a roof, and the roof is the status quo, okay, this roof up here is the status quo. So that's the way things always are. It's the way they've always been. They're always going to be. And then what holds them up? 
Well, a lot of the, the here, the military holds them up. The media and what the media says holds it up. The judiciary and how they enforce laws and interpret laws holds it up. All the bureaucracies that are set up, you know, to, to all the uh, governmental bureaucracies, et cetera, whether it's on a local level or a federal level or in between. Politicians, they're saying all the same things. That holds it up. And they're going to only get voted back in if they do what the people want. So the politicians are holding it up. Business holds it up. The police hold it up. So at different times, it's important to know where people, where the these uh, these uh, pillars are. Who do you need to focus on, and which ones do you need to start working to bring down? Because once you bring one pillar down, it weakens the roof. You bring two down, it weakens it more. You bring four down. You see what I'm saying? You're weakening these, and that's where the work comes in. Now, sometimes, for instance, right before the um, 2020 election, some of us started thinking that it was very possible that there could be a coup in our country with the MAGA faction. So we had to do some assessment. Who do we ha who did we have to look at? Well, we had to look at um, did we have to look at the military? Fortunately, we did not feel like we had to look at the military. We were not afraid that the military was going to step in and do what the MAGA faction and the at, at the time the person who was in charge wanted wanted them to do. Um, we did think we had to look at bureaucracies and we we all that, you know, Rafsenberg and all those people who were called and all the pushing that happened and had to we had to look at bureaucracies and see where people were. Obviously politicians, we had uh, insurrectionist politicians who are now in office and were in office. We had, we had a question about business. Business started to change, but that was some, so this is some of the things you have to look at. Every Not every situation is these really tight and are the key, everything has to be worked on at once. You have to kind of evaluate with your campaign, where are people on this? And that's an important, that's part of that investigating work that I said sometimes people don't wanna do, but it's critical. So if you would all like to do investigations, please, please do that. It's much easier now to do it with um, Google and, and uh, internet and so forth than we ever had before. But this kind of investigation is really critical for what, what we need to know. And at, you need to know also what's going on in your community. Need to know who's in power in the community, as I said before. So there's lots of investigation that we often don't do that we should. Okay, this is sort of the emotional state of where people are. Up here is kind of the enduring crisis that's going on. And then there's the uprising and then it peaks and then it falls. So Often people, growing public anger here, which I, I'm going to take what happened with Black Lives Matter because it's the easiest for me to point out. Growing public anger was happening. Trigger event, George Floyd. All of a sudden, heroic phase, honeymoon. Everyone's out on the street. 600 people in Mifflinburg of all places. God knows what all is going on, you know. And then what happened? September and October or after that? uh not so much right so there's the dis disillusionment that happens but this only means we are entering stage six which we're going to talk about and this is learning and reflection and all the work that we need to do that we've just been talking about educating ourselves reaching out to people who are not with us already being ready for another trigger event planning what is our, doing the research and planning what we, the kind of work. That all goes on in here. It's not as juicy and wonderful as being out on the street and all the wonderful feelings we had, but it's the reality of what happens. Any thoughts on that, what we've been talking about? Just unmute yourself. 
like I said before, it, it's good to see these things because, you know, when you're going through them, you don't realize that the curve is going to go back up. <laughs> you know, you just you just know what's going down, you know, and you need to you and other people in your group need to see, OK, it, yeah, it's going to go down. That's that's part of it, but it'll come back up again. So, yeah, I'm very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Other thoughts on this? Well, I, I love the word evolution, the learning and reflection phase. I, I write, I keep a journal, and so there's this imprint that I'm leaving, you know, as a writer. But I think after living through this cycle every decade or so, I, I thought, is it just going to repeat and repeat and repeat? Are we really moving forward to what you have there is a new normal, this regrowth. I'm excited. I mean, growth is exciting. You know, if that's where we are, I'm encouraged. But um, when you keep saying this is what we have to do, our coalition, I, I think that we in Pittsburgh, in our community, I'm looking forward to seeing who the we is that coalescing here in our evolution. Well, the the we the we has been working on all this yes yeah um, some years past uh pen talked about you know doing your research and figuring out who's connected to who that the process called power mapping which the thomas merton center has had multiple workshops on over the years yeah. and there are now software platforms just for that I, uh, gonna, it's important i'm going to be also very honest about this I think that some of this understanding of the kind of work we need to do to build a movement has been lost. And I, I, I am among those who feel like we, we didn't keep that information going. So a lot of times there is a one-off demonstration. And I'm, I'm going to mention one that is dear to my heart, but was one-off in many ways. And that was the women's march that happened after... Um, Trump was elected. It was huge. It was wonderful. People were really uh, excited. It brought in young people. There were many, many people who went and many who supported it, who weren't able to go, but supported it. But it did not start building anything after that. Small groups came back to their communities and started building, but there was nothing built into it. And often uh, that's what, what I've seen is sort of what I call one-off demonstrations, where we get out there, we express, you know, I've, I've been part of these, you know, we express what we feel about what something that's happened, whether it be what's happening on the border or with trans children or whatever it is. And then we go home and we feel good. We feel better. It's in the newspaper for a day or two, and then it disappears. We've not been doing the hard work. So when you say, I feel like we go through the cycle, yeah, in a way we have, but have we really been doing the work that's needed? And that's the question. And that's what, and I'll talk at the end tonight about um, Pennsylvania Action um, on Climate, PAC, which I work with and, and um, Jim works with and so forth. And one of the things that we're trying to do is really educate people as to how to build a movement, not how to get arrested, or how to demonstrate, or how to just lobby, but all the things that, the, that, that, that they are part of is building a movement, and how do we do that? And this workshop will give you a little bit of a roadmap, but you can't just go, oh, okay, got that, That's that, uh, and now I know how to build a movement. No, that it takes time and thinking, and it actually takes working with other people and, and working through the steps and then coming together with other organizations and seeing what they're doing. It's not a simple matter. So when you say, I feel like we've been sort of going around and around a bit, I, I agree with you on that. And I'm hoping this kind of workshop and the work that PAC is doing and the work that all of you can potentially do will start building uh, more of a movement and not just people being out there when we're outraged. Any well, thing about One thing about the Women's March and the lack of relative lack of follow up, although there have been more women's marches, um, is that one of the notable things about that march is that there's so many people who that was their first time getting out on the streets for anything. Mm -hmm. And 
that was energy that was insufficiently harnessed because those people didn't know what was needed to keep the movement going. Yes. And the people who ran it didn't didn't know how to harness them. Yes. Yes. You've you've worked you've you've picked a word that we need to work on. How do we harness energy? Um, how do we really harness energy and turn it in a direction that is able to be used to really move something, not harness energy just to express ourselves, but to really move things. Betsy. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, my experience with the Women's March is also that <clears throat> when people went out there, just because they didn't necessarily do a centralized marches to follow that does not mean that the women didn't split off into little local neighborhood groups yeah. and have an effect, to, you know, be very effective that yeah. way. So I think it's important to recognize that there's stuff going on. You may not be, it may not be big and public and fancy, but it's substantive. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm going to move on a little bit here. Um, and Marin, if there's things in the chat, I, I'm I'm not good at multitasking on this kind of stuff. So um, the next thing I want I'm, we're going to look at, I think, is it also is helpful for us to be aware of, and that is this chart here. So you see here the the business as usual that you know the different um, stages. Second stage normal times third there's conditions ripen then the fourth the takeoff activist failure you see that's in dark because we hope we don't have to go through that if we're aware of it we don't have to go through it win the majority of the public success and moving on now i want you to notice where the the top line here is this top line here public awareness of the pro of the of the um, problem so you start here and you can see that the public awareness especially with takeoff keeps growing, right? And it keeps pretty high, the public awareness. Awareness does not mean activity. It means awareness. That means that people who normally are not thinking about these things go, oh yeah, I heard about that before. Yeah, that's what a public awareness is. Um, now look at the public opposition, this line in the middle here. So no, when nothing's happening, very little public opposition, but look what happens here. Where does it go? It goes right up after takeoff. Public opposition. Those who are fighting against us. Those who believe in white supremacy. Those who don't want trans children to, yeah, we're talking about those people. So notice when the majority of the public, during this phase, where is it? It's peaking. There is pushback. There is a lot of pushback and it stays pretty high. And this one does not feel very good. And this is the one where we're seeing a lot of it right now out of Florida and Texas and God knows where and locally. Um, I have a Moms, Moms for Liberty group in my little town in Mifflinburg. Um, sorry, I'm gonna go back here. Um, so this does not feel good, but this is this is what happens. This is part of what happens. The public opposition happens while we're fighting as hard as we can and people are aware of it, lots of public opposition. Being aware does not mean you're against it. Being aware sometimes means, oh, time to start a Moms for Liberty. Now I wanna say something. The moms who go to Moms for Liberty in my little town are not the ones who really, they're going for different reasons. They are going because they're not happy with the schools and they have other issues, but they are being used by people who are using that, that so that using Moms for Liberty as a way of pushing back. So this is a, not just pub, public, uh, there is also people who are making it happen, who want to stop things and are using people to do that. Last one here, the public support. Now look at this. Look where opposition is and where public support is. Starts small. Oops. Keep this stop. Starts small here, grows a little bit. Doesn't really come up very high until success. 
all during this time, look at the difference between public opposition and public support. Pretty darn big here, right? So if, it is, if it's not feeling very good, that's why. Because public support doesn't come up until you finally, it's already part of, it's the water you start to swim in. Oh, oh yeah, okay, we can't discriminate. Uh, uh, okay, I guess that's right. We'll just have to go along with that. And after a while, it's like, yeah, that's the way it is. So public opposition is always going to be stronger and it does not feel good. And right now, here's where we are in six. Here is the opposition. Here's the support. No wonder why we don't feel so good. What, whatever it is that we're in, if we're in, you know, certainly climate, et cetera. So I just wanted to point that out because I think that's an important piece. Any any thoughts on that? Uh, my, my only thought is I, I I'm not sure I understand the the graphic there because it says public opposition to policy to power holder policies. So when I first glanced at it, I thought it was talking about uh, the public opposing what we're opposing, you know, what, what, what the power holders are doing. But what you're describing is what yeah, I'm, I'm feeling is, <laughs> is, is that, yeah, that it, with it, within the public, there are some who kind of react against us. Yeah. That, that, this is more that, I don't know why they say that, that is confusing, Okay. but it, it really is more, you know, that, that you do have public opposition. When you're trying to change something, there is going to be pushback. And when you're changing something that is huge, like white supremacy or fossil fuel industry or how the medical establishment is set up or any of the things that we've mentioned that we're talking about, attitudes towards women, attitudes towards uh, gender, transgender, whatever the issue is, there's going to be lots of opposition because change, people don't like it. They really don't like it. And some, sometimes it'll be opposition within your own group, you know, yeah. you know, we, we, we have a group that's focused on a fairly narrow issue, but there's at least one person who's basically a climate, climate denier. Uh, and, and we all are kind of like, well, we don't want to lose that person, but <laughs> it, it, it gets a little hard sometimes. <laughs> yes, it does. It does. Um, I'm if, if anything else, cause I'm going to move on. I'm, I'm aware of time and I, I will end at eight, I promise, but I, I do want to do a few more things. I told you, what? I told you, Marin, that I would have plenty. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, there does seem to be in the chat, there's a lot of uh, resonances with all these stages and reference yeah, to the Cain Feingold good. Act. Yeah, and I think the next time we meet, that's some of what we're going to be talking about. Where do people see their movements? Where, you know, how, how are people, re you know, reacting to a lot of things? So this just goes through the normal times, the prove of failure, the ripening conditions, the takeoff, perception of failure, the majority public opinion, the end game and success and continuation. And through all of these, we have to keep in mind that tension is building. There is tension whenever you make change. And so to just to be aware of that and to be aware within each of these stages, where are the most, where, where are people most useful in the, those four activists, four types of activists? So um, just to, you know, with, with um, the normal times, so what, what, what activists are the most useful during normal times? And, and prove the failure of official institutions. Just quickly, what, what would people say? Which of the four activists? So you have the reformer, you have the um, citizen, you have the change agent, and you have the rebel. The, the reformer, I guess, it's using the official system yep. to prove its own flaws. Exactly. So people doing research, um, their own flaws, et cetera. Where is the rebel most active? Yeah. 
takeoff? Yep. Yep. Out on the street, out on the street. And then what happens then when they, when, when that's changes and you, what's going on in the majority public opinion, what's going on in, 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 in six afterwards, what, what change, a, what, what people do you need for that one? Doug? You're muted, Doug. The networkers. Yep. The networkers. You need the networkers. You need the you 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 need the reformers, right? To start looking at, at yep. things. You need the citizen uh, to be out there, you know, working with people and reaching out to people. And what happens then with the with the um the people who are like to get out on the street? Anybody? One thing, is, one thing is that they start picking up, I mean, something that I saw at the recent New York City climate march was the degree of uh, anger with failing shortcomings of the current uh rate of progress yes and so yeah there and and this also leads to an anti-voting movement or a yeah. vote for a person who's great but would never in a million years win the third which in our system is a merely third party candidate we so need ranked choice voting but are the republicans going to institute it no Exactly. No, that's that that's that that's the important piece to remember here is that they've been front and center. The ones who who the, the demonstrators have been out there, the ones who are out feel comfortable being out on the street. And suddenly they're that piece. It's not that they're not needed, but that aspect of their work is not needed. So if they don't have other ways of doing political work, they're going to be feeling left out and it's going to turn to you're not doing the right thing we were doing the right thing and then there's a lot of infighting that goes on and just to be really aware of that that's one of the major things that happens in stage six and one of the ways to deal with that is to say once again there will come times when we need your energy to be out on the street but right now we need to do other work and if you and to say to them we're in stage 6 that's not that's that's the networkers time that's the reformers time and the citizens time your time will come again but not right now and to really tell them they have a role to play but don't let them get you or other people angry or upset or push you into doing things or feel like your work is not needed the perfect is the enemy of the good. Yep. And and when perfection is seen not only as result but as type of process. Yes. Um so we one trick ponies. Yeah. are only uh, have limited utility to the movement versus more uh versatile. Yes. actors. Yes. So that's one of the reasons why it's really good if you can, you know, if you can make sure that you have other skills. If you're somebody who likes to be out on the street, that's great. That's wonderful. Um, but you need to have other skills because otherwise you're going to, you know, kind of get lost. So we're going to move on. To, I know I should be giving people a break, but I, I really want to get sort of get through this. Are we okay with just going on a little bit more? Some people might uh, find it necessary to drop yep. off, but yep. I think they've heard that there is going to be a recording. And so, yep, please do. Um, that will also help catch up people who want to come in November and can't, aren't here now. They can get a leg up. Uh, by seeing what we've been talking about today. Yes. Thanks, Maren. Yep. 
please um, don't don't stay if this is too much you but <laughs> I just want to touch on all of this so there's a lot to say how is the map model useful these are some of the questions that when we meet next in November in November in the next meeting we'll be talking a little bit about that so if you're going to come to that meeting and you are working with the movement I, this this would be some of the questions um and this, these you actually could write down, but just be thinking about how is the map model useful? And does it show what is going on for us? Where are we in the model? And what does the model say about what we have to do next? I'm going to actually focus on stage six because I think that's the stage that the environmental movement's in. And I call this moving the movement because it's moving the movement forward and it's not sexy and easy to see. And it's very, uh, a lot of hard work and not all of it is fun. And um, it's hard to keep track of everything, but that's where we're gonna start looking at stage six and some of the things for stage six. Um, one of the things that is important, as I said, stage six, the, uh, most of the work of stage six is really the work of making sure that you reach out to a lot of people. Um, that is really important in stage six. That's what we, we should be doing. And, and um, I can, I do a lot of work with people uh, about how to reach out to people who are not of like mind and don't have the same views as us, but are persuadable and how to message things, et cetera. So reaching out to larger groups of people than we've been working with and how to build a larger base is part of it. So, so it's time, figuring out what's next is not a formula, but it's also not just more of the same. We have to do something different in stage six. It's time to move the movement from the streets to the specific halls of power in question. And that's in addition to the work that I said about reaching out to people. So it takes analysis and insight. And I've referred to this before, and if you work with me, you'll hear this a lot. Power mapping, your community, whether it's the state, the country, or your little small town, your power mapping of your community is important. The other piece that's really important is to look at those who are making the problem. Who is, is it a company that's making the problem? and then sort of know more about that company. Is that company get money from banks? Then look into the banks and look into that. Are they in alliance with and, and being supported by government agents who shouldn't be supporting them? Then look at the government agents. There's lots of power mapping that you need to do about the, the, the entity that's causing the harm. Um, and then you wanna look at the large levers where, what would be the most powerful thing to change that? And that takes a lot of thinking and a lot of not just thinking in your small group, but with other people. And who can you connect up with? And I think Cadest talked about that, that you know they were doing things at the same time as other um, people were doing things, in, um, actions and being in touch with them. You have to stay so... Analysis and insight, huge piece. And this is a huge piece that we often don't do. Just want to put that out. Must stay responsive and nimble. She talked about that, uh, about how they come back with something now, for instance, in the, in the um, move, in the uh, 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 movement, that were, the, the, the climate movement, they're coming back with, you know, good carbon, you know, good, uh, uh, all sorts of, you know, how to use right in my area, we're fighting, they want to take plastics, take them all together, melt them down, wash them off using the Susquehanna River and redo them in other plastics. Well, what good is that? You know, so you have to start looking at there, you have to be nimble because they're going to find ways, look for opportunities, Ex anticipate their response and their pushback and stay on the uh, offense not just in the streets, but on the offense and educating people in what you're bringing forth. And in, in, in Pennsylvania, there was just a, the Democrats got together and did a um, 
uh, a piece of legis wrote a piece of legislation. It's not going to pass because just Democrats, but that's being on the offense, you know, not not being on the defense, but staying on the offense. Um, so that's some of the work that needs to happen in stage six. I'm going to talk a little bit um, specifically about um, in stage six, some of the things in terms of pushback that you're going to get because um, so the main work of stage six to create social change through long-term grassroots struggles with the power holders. What's your organization's primary focus and what issues are you working on? These, that's some of the research to come up with the answers of that and what's the, the best way of, 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 of doing that. So the research part and understanding where this long-term campaign is gonna go is, is, is critical. And then beyond that, you're gonna remember some other things. We are telling the truth about a violation of values. Don't forget about the values that the majority of citizens, that should be primary and upfront in whatever you put out in talking to people, whether it be people of like mind of politics or people who don't have the same views that you have. What are the values you're holding on to? What's the violation in your area of focus? And what is the truth you have to tell? That's a lot of what Cadest talked about, about storytelling. That's where the storytelling comes in. I was, you know, I'm just going to give you a little quick talking about, uh, I was born on this land. My parents lived on this land. Now it's being fracked. I can't even live here. I can't pass it on to my children. What does that mean in terms of my life? That's the kind of storytelling of values. I always thought in rural Pennsylvania that I could pass this on to my children and I can't. That's the kind of storytelling and the values that we need to be pushing. Not how it's injuring this or that, the other, all the facts that we know. You need to know those facts, but that's not the storytelling. Um, the other thing to remember is that you are always going to get pushback. And it's going to come um, in different forms um, from different people in power, and you should be um, ready for, with, with this. So you got to, You have you. Which pillars do you need to focus on? We've kind of talked about that. Different pillars are going to give you different kind of pushback. So know where you're putting your energies. If you have limited energy, pick one of the pillars and work on that first. But you're going to get pushback, whether it's from the media or the judiciary or the politicians. You're always going to get pushback. But sort of look at where are you going to put your 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 energy? And there might be a pillar that's not even there. That's part of the work of what you're going to be figuring out. So when you do get pushback, um, and it's kind of important to see um, that um, you 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 want to keep focused on the issue. And keep it in the society spotlight. So letters to the editor, meetings, open meetings, focusing on educating, converting the general population, the key demands and the sub movements. You have to keep aware of that. New visions that include a paradigm shift. So, so that's a, some of the stuff we'll be using for how you're doing, how your group is doing, um, and we'll be talking more about that next time. But you want to be looking at what your group is doing and seeing where whether you are doing re or outreach, how well that's going, do you need help in doing the outreach? Do you need help in doing um, the, uh, looking at what the key demands are and doing the power mapping, get some help. Um, so this is once again, talking about, um, I'm gonna just jump over this a little bit, but you wanna develop strong grassroots organizations, you want to create a strategic campaign that morphs and can change as the power holders change. You develop ways that people can take ethical action on issues before there is a change in laws. So you want to help people to, to, to be involved in whatever ways they can, um, whether that be you know, switching to, in, in, in terms of environment, and switching to different kinds of modes away from fossil fuel or whatever. Now it's being helped because of the Inflation Reduction um, and the Bipartisan Act. Um, you want to build an active coalition of organizations. So this is bringing different organizations working on some similar things, somewhat different, but similar 
if it's environmentally based, expand the work to mainstream political and social institutions and processes. Some of this we'll get into more about how you reach out to people and using nonviolent action activities when needed. And that when needed is really, is, is really important. Um, so some of this we'll be talking about next, next time a little more and, and sort of thinking about your organization and, and looking at how well you're doing or where you need help and what kind of help would you need um, to do that. Um, so one of the things that you will get is pushback, as I said, um, and that's something to be aware of and to be aware of early on in terms of what kind of tricks the opposition can use. So here's some common ones I've heard over the time. If you stop protesting, we can negotiate. Actually, I'm going to ask um, uh, uh, Frank. Are you still there, Frank? Frank's still there. Somebody else. I want to find somebody who will read this. Julia, will you unmute yourself and read this? Yes. Um, okay, some tricks commonly used by the opposition. One, if you stop protesting, we can negotiate. Two, we're inviting you to the stockholders meeting or the commission or some other place of power. Three, go and talk to these other groups who want the same thing, i.e. stop bothering us. Four, I'm the wrong person. Five, I agree with all your complaints, but there, maybe I can't see the end is nothing I can do. Nothing I can do. Knew yeah. it. <laughs> thank you, Julia. Thank you. Nothing I can do. So these are some common ones that I've heard. Don't let these stop you. Be prepared for them and be prepared for what you're going to say when they say that, because it's very common that the first line of defense for people in power is to tell you, You've come to the wrong person, we're the wrong people, we can't help, I've done everything I can, whatever. Just be prepared for that and 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 be ready to do something different when they say that. Um, and and to really point out what they either what they can be doing or that you don't take that as an answer. Um that, yeah. Uh Tommaso asked in the chat a question that I want to answer and want to hear your answer but said as a younger activist why is the invitation to a stockholder meeting a trick um and i want to say that my experience in organizing my union felt at times like being in the leadership level that the steel workers wanted to see a small level of activists get into um was also an effort to get their ideas into the leadership of our union for us to then tell our members rather than us organizing with our members. So that's kind of how I take that one, but I wanna hear what you meant by it. Yeah, um, if you're being invited, this is a common way of saying, well, two or three of you come to our meeting of 25 people, you know, just two or three of you, we can't have everybody here, but just two or three of you come. Um, and feeling like then you can kind of take people off. I, what I've noticed in the new type of organizing that's going on with SEIU and others is that all members are updated. It's not a closed, uh, just some of us are gonna go and negotiate. It's educating people as to um, how to how to deal with um, the, the, those in power, ha, going together, et cetera. So it's a very different, this is a, we're going to separate you out, but uh, nothing against going. It's just going to stockholders in large groups, going to stockholders meetings or whatever. I'm, I'm not against that, but just when it's separating you out, that's the problem. Does that answer? Is that mm -hmm. an answer? To what you were wondering. Um, it could be an answer of of Tomaso's uh inquiry uh yeah he says it helped paint a better picture um it is uh the 
Pittsburgh Labor Choir has a song about that. Don't go complaining about alone, friend, about the boss and his lies, because we're one, two, three times as strong when we organize. Right. And uh, there was, uh, before I get to Helen, there was uh, a couple things in the chat. Um, back to the map stages. Um, at what level is it most useful to apply the map model? Are we evaluating a broad movement at a national level or at the other end, is it possible that different local campaigns within a broad movement, such as the environmental movement are at different map stages? Absolutely. I In think fact, so. a, a campaign plus a campaign plus a campaign makes a movement and a movement plus a movement pays a larger movement makes for larger social change. So little units of, of this, it can be small units. You can use this model for small units or larger units, et cetera. And it's building within a common framework that you're thinking and working from. I hope that answers. Mm -hmm. And Penn tossed another good resource in, um, a link to uh, the third age, the third act, <laughs> the third yes. age, um, which is uh, what Bill McKibben has spent a lot of his time on since uh, he founded and proceeded with 350 for many years. Um, a list of 12 different areas of action that are directed towards different targets, legislators, reg regulators, industries, corporations, banks, research. Yes or no, just research the the links on that page, which is thirdact.org slash act. Yes, yeah, so that's a great organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and now Helen. Yes, can... Helen. Sometimes it's an invitation from power holders to actually be on the commission. <laughs> so I was invited to be part of the Pittsburgh Commission on Human Relations, and the mayor was very upset that I continued working as part of activist <laughs> movements. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, you know, I, there was an expectation that because he had appointed me, I would need to support his policies or not challenge his policies. Um, yeah. And he actually tried to remove me and other commissioners <laughs> because of some of the public stances that we were taking. Um, so uh, it's it's a very tempting thing to be invited into, um, you know, some vehicle of power where you're told you can make changes on the inside but it's it's often a way to um co-opt or deflect the or the energy of of people who are um move parts of movements exactly We're making trouble on the outside yeah the divide and conquer is a very common yeah thank you helen anybody else Oh, uh, yes. Uh, reminds Tommaso of the common quote, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. Yes. <laughs> I can tell this is a political science graduate. Yes. Um, good. I, I'm going to jump kind of towards the end here. I'm going to give some resources that are here. Um, and actually, um, I think, let's see. I don't know the best way of doing this. Maybe I take, can, Maren, can you take a picture of this and send um, it? Sure. Let me, I think because I, 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 I mean, you were going to share the link to this video, which there was some issues. About I was going to share. I am going to share that. Yes, so, I will. Definitely, but anyway, I just took a screenshot. Yeah. The, Bill Moyer's book, the this one, a climate resistance handbook, and um, there is an uprising. This is an uprising. All of those are good. Now I'm gonna stop sharing here. Um, and I'm gonna say there are a couple of other good books. Somebody asked for um, uh, The Art of Activism by two people named Steve and Steve. If you put The Art of Activism, this book will come up. This has a lot of really good things about using um, theater and um, uh, all sorts of art and so forth. So I, I highly recommend this book. Um, I highly recommend, um, this is George Lakey's book, How We Win. Many of you have seen that I've pushed this book, How We Win by George Lakey. It talks about social movements. 
It doesn't do it in uh, the stages, um, but it has a lot of other information that we have not covered that's really good about movement building in this book. Um, and um, for any of you who don't know, there's David Pepper, who's uh, very active in Ohio, has done a lot of good work. His book, um, Laboratories of Autocracy, explain why the state, um, our state legislatures are our dangerous spots right now. We're seeing that. Don't have to explain that to people, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And this book, Saving Democracy, is a book about how to reach out. Um, it's, it's electoral politics oriented, but it can be used for any. And I'm using it in a workshop that I'm doing of how we reach out to build our base among the persuadables. So um, please know that Pennsylvania Action on Climate, we do all sorts of training, this kind of training and others. We are really interested in helping groups come together and um, work together. It's not easy to do, especially in our rural area, but um, it's really critical in terms of building our power together. Um, so I just wanna, I want, I'm going to stop here. I know it's eight o'clock and I really thank you all for sticking with it. And I hope that it was helpful. Well, thank you. Um, that was some incredible, let's check in the check. Oh, someone else has a link. Bill Moyers map link. Um, oh yeah. And a piece of advice when you are invited into the halls of power ask what is going to be expected in exchange so so yes thank you for leading us in this um uh very enlightening to say the least um window into helicopter well bird's eye strategy and i, I think sort of like when when one is in a difficult situation, whether it's an illness or a, anything, and one sometimes has to be reminded that one isn't alone. So looking at the evolution of a movement and saying, you know, I don't know what's going on. If, if you're in a particular campaign or movement and and you don't know where to turn and you don't know why what's happening is happening, this kind of tool can be helpful to gain perspective. It's like, oh yeah, we did go through that stage before. Maybe that's where I wanna head. So I think this was both philosophical and potentially very practical. So thank you so much, Penn, and thank you in absentia, Kedas Gibre. Yeah. Um, Margaret has something to say. Well, I I think it's just amazing um, how we could be coordinated in this way. Is Pittsburgh ready for like some kind of a an that eagle's view? Who's pulling all the various different organizations together? How do we see this coordinated effort? There are fractions. There's the Kingsley. There's Hazelwood. There's Squirrel Hill. Is there some kind of a higher level of coordination for our, our movement here? There, there are different dimensions. And I guess I'm going to jump in here because Penn lives over yeah. in far away land. Um, Thank you. There are different dimensions. So there's the geographical dimension that you're alluding to. You know, there's stuff going on in Hazelwood. It's totally different than the stuff that's going on in Wilkinsburg. Yeah. That's totally different than the stuff going on in Larimer. It's totally different than the stuff's going on in Squirrel Hill or downtown or anywhere else. Um, there's also realms of 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 the work and the the issues. There's housing. There's transit. There's climate. There's pollution. So are we having a big symposium soon of all of these? There are. There's a symposium. Hey, look on, on Marin's list. And well, in the salon announcement for this salon, one of the events is an environmental justice conference happening on Friday the 27th at La Roche College. So I'm gonna that's put my, I'm gonna I'm gonna put the, the link in the chat. Thank um, you, Helen. Yes. Had it um, ready to go. 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you. And so there, there is a lot going on. A group that Helen has had a lot to do with uh, is the uh, Green New Deal discussion group because Green New Deal is either a popular idea or an unpopular idea, depending on who you talk about, who you talk to. From from me, from my standpoint, it's like, it's all the good things. Go AOC. Unfortunately, Washington is more complicated and uh, uh, dysfunctional and polarized than, I mean, it's like we say everybody, everybody thinks that everybody should have clean air and clean water. Everybody that thinks that everybody should house housing, but some people don't actually think that, or at least they don't act like it. So um, the people who don't need it, don't care if the other people get it or the, you know, the whole haves and haves nots thing. The, the irony is that the Republicans and the MAG Republicans in particular have somehow managed to grab the attention of people who are made to vote against their own best interests. And uh, I, I don't know how they do it because you have, uh, you know, obvious policy disjoint and I is disjoint from what they're saying. And that's the values versus the actual policies that Penn was talking about. Uh, Jim has something to say. Yeah, um, you had asked like, you know, what what's happening to maybe pull this all together. Uh, back in uh, March, uh, end of March, March 30th, 31st, uh, Penn was part of uh, 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 a conference workshop that we had at Slippery Rock mm -hmm. University. Um, we called it the the Campfire Gathering. Uh, George Lakey was was on our, one of our main featured speakers. He was there. Veronica Coptis um, and uh, uh, Michael Badges Canning was there as well. And and we we kind of started a process of trying to get groups, especially in Western PA, um, working together. And mm -hmm. um, and you know we we had a number of good meetings. I think. Uh, somewhere towards the end of the summer, you know, everybody got busy with the, the, the convergence and other things. And, and, you know, we didn't get as much done as we wanted, but we, we would like to jumpstart that again at some point, um, getting groups. Uh, I mean, the first step was the groups had to get to know each other and, and we've started mm -hmm. doing that. Um, but because uh, a lot of times uh, that that mouse vision uh, that, that uh, yeah. Penn said was really a good analogy is like you're, you're so focused on your own thing. That's what I'm you saying. Just, you don't even realize, you know, mm -hmm. like we didn't realize our, our group's a, a Slipper Rock Grove City based group. We didn't realize there were two other environmental groups in in Slipper Rock, you know, just mm -hmm. for, for like years, you know, <laughs> and nobody had connection to one another. You know, it, that, that's how, how how siloed you get sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um uh, so, so that there is that we're going to try to do more with that, and maybe next month when when we we reconvene the salon, maybe we'll have some more we can talk mm -hmm. about with regards to that. And the Pitts, I mean, Breathe Project for issues that relate to air quality and climate, which go together hand in hand. Um, the Breathe Project has tried to provide some of that bird's eye view and st strategic thinking. And Matt Mahalik, who was here for a chunk of today's session and will be here uh, next week, we'll talk more about that. Um, there's a Pittsburgh Climate Action Network. I mean, years ago, I was involved in getting the um, climate reality leadership um, group started in our region after the training was done here in 2017. And there was, um, and I was thinking, you know, and every group is trying to be like, we are the go-to climate group, or we are the go-to air quality group. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a calendar that everybody's going to look at and everybody's going to send their stuff to. And because at the time there were a good half a dozen groups working on climate, either as their sole focus as one of their major fo fo focus mm -hmm. areas. And so uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, Penn Environment does a lot on climate, 350 Pittsburgh, Climate Reality Leadership Corps, uh, Southwest Pens Pittsburgh and Southwestern PA, and Sierra Club, and probably another one or two that I'm not even thinking of at the moment. And uh, and then there's student groups on campuses and uh, 350 yeah, helped that, that... get started a, 
as a network, but it was right before the pandemic. And so the meetings kind of fizzled out, but that's being revivified now. I mean, that's what I remember. I mean, I've been with you in most of that, you know, semi subgroup organizing. And I think prompted by this wonderful conversation. And I think when we met again at the farmer's market, it's like, I, I'm actually hoping to see in the next period of time, you know, that major conference, you know, so that we see what we're doing. We, we lay it out, the analysis, the hard work of the analysis of where are we locally? What have we accomplished in our diverse groups? What are the communities doing? And then pull us together because I, I think we do have to be coordinated if we're going to be successful. And I haven't seen it in the 10 years that I've been working at this too. I was a part of the climate reality and all of the training. And it just seemed to fragment after that. There were so many leaders taking on a role, but I don't see the all of our movement with a strategy that I know of, that I know of. There's a lot of meetings you don't go to, Margaret. Believe no, me. I'm not. You're probably well, happier that's the that problem. way. No, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Is there a publication? <laughs> Can we put together some kind of a local, you know, a hub of information where the strategy is placed? This group's working on here. This is great. You know, plug in somehow. If there's a map as to where the push is and how we're coordinating our various different platforms, I think that would be helpful for me to see where I could be more useful. Um, I do. Thing, I have gone to a lot of meetings. I'm kind of burnt out on them. Yeah. That's what I'm trying um, to revive, remake my own. Yeah, 350 yeah. has a newsletter every month. Um, and I'm not sure, Kate, do you know what our, our mailing list used to be? About 800. I can only imagine it's bigger now. And, well, I, I think it's just not yeah. enough that we have these separate but, groups anymore. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, that's I, what I, the Climate Action Network is trying to do and who, who's trying to do who i mean climate network all those groups that i mentioned or at least a bunch of them well Kate, they, feel free to speak up if you're still actually with so us so there's a hierarchy of coordination in other words and people are doing that i just not seeing it no i i think margaret that lo people are trying to do it people are trying very desperately and i would suggest that when you get at, at, at a point where you not, don't feel burned out, that you were one of the ones who said, I like to see the big picture. I like to work on that. That could be part of your work is to do that. You could stay focused on that as part of your work because people, as Jim said, people are mouse vision, you know, because they have to be to keep their organizations afloat and keep going. Mm -hmm. But if you could take that on and work with others to get some others who are, who are, are it's not going to just happen, mm -hmm. you know, people are, but people mm -hmm. see that this is the kind of direction we need to go in and not be siloed any longer. Mm -hmm. Take that on as their work. So I, I, I throw that out to you when you're ready, you are the person who said, do you like to look at the larger picture? Take that on. You'll find your way. You know, so I just, wanted, I, I just wanted to say that because once we realize that what we're building towards, what goes into a campaign plus a campaign plus a candidate, we all need to work together. Once we realize that and enough people realize that, then we'll start working towards that. And it's going to take some people. Jim's, uh, excuse me, Jim, I, I know you well enough to say this. Jim's, his, he's mouse vision. He's Ciesra. He's on Ciesra. You don't have Ciesra, so you can be a larger vision. We need people like you to be the ones who do that. Don't expect the mouse vision people to have time or energy or vision to do larger. The people like you who have a larger vision, that's the, those are the people who need to start start keeping the vision on that. And that's what that's what uh, PAC is working on, Pennsylvania Action on Climate. And we'll do it for any any kind of, you know, we're on climate, but we'll do it for yeah. any. And Jim is also lead editor on another monthly newsletter, yeah. the Campfire Dispatch, which kind of grew out of the climate convergence and this campfire gathering, which did not actually have a campfire because it was cold and rainy and it <laughs> yeah. didn't happen. But 
it was too expensive <laughs> to get to get the insurance for a campfire so oh, there you couldn't go. do that but so, the campfire dispatch and Marin's one of the editors of that as well i mean that, that's that, that's the eagle eyed thing we're trying to get groups to see each other to to hear what each other's doing uh get them in communication with one another mm -hmm. uh because yeah when you're working with a group you have to be focused on what that group's mm -hmm. doing <laughs> and it takes up your time it's a time suck <laughs> it yeah. really is mm -hmm. but this we activism all, uh, stuff takes Effort. Yeah, at, at a certain point, you realize what we, the mouse vision by itself isn't enough. You have to spend a little bit of time trying to do the eagle vision. I, I love that analogy. So, <laughs> Marin's recent uh, bl blog post has at least fifteen things going on this month. I mean, between now and next month, mm -hmm. it's so many things. I mean, I don't know. Uh, the, I don't know how to sort through it all, but there's there's a lot going on. Yeah, the and the list that's on Marin's list on on Marin's list used to be a an events online listing of environmental and social justice events, but then the platform disallowed setting dates into the future, and that made it an order of magnitude more difficult. So I just fold events into the salon notices, and for the most part, and um, so the. It does the salon notice as posted on Marin's list does include events back to whenever I got that notice up. Um, so that can give you a handle. But yeah, I mean, that's how Marin's list started was there was so much going on. The first it started by email, and the first email had 31 different things happening in the lead up to Earth Day of 2007. And um so and there have been months with 30 or 40 events so i'm gonna have to get off i've enjoyed being with you i look forward to but this is the issue that we're going to be dealing with looking at e each individual who comes on their movement and how we can help but also the larger one so margaret if you have time and you want to contact me Marin mm -hmm. will give you your my email and you could take the lead in eagle vision OK, because that's what you're asking. Where is the Eagle Vision? Well, it's not there as much as we need it. So people like you and others, we need that Eagle Vision. Um, so I will see you all. I hopefully will see you all uh, on the 12th. I will be there. Um, Marin, you and I will be in touch. Um, mm -hmm. But I can do some of the end. I will be uh, some of what I was doing at the end here. I can start with some of that if that's helpful. I don't know. We'll have to talk, see where people are, who wants to come on. Um, I may just be there just to listen and give my mm -hmm. thoughts as it comes up. We'll, we'll talk yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. But I think between now and then, you'll be getting the um, two sheets on activists, the activists and the other and and the um, uh, the link, link to, to the video. looking at the YouTube video. So mm -hmm. we'll be looking at those things. Very cool. Thank you so yes. much, Penn. Thank and you. thank you all thank you. Uh, you. for... Thank you. Participating uh, in this very interactive workshop. Um, Thanks, and... everyone. Yeah, thank Being you. Gives me hope. Being on call <laughs> like this is what gives me hope. Bye, yeah. everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Take hey, care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.